and his voice is breaking like almost like he wants to cry because i'd made friends with him right i'd mm-hmm. made really good friends with him which is a nice 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 man and he's like andrew you got to come to the gas station because my margins are so big right any time there's i mean i'm hoping the interest rates stay high mm-hmm. right i mean i i'm probably the only person in real estate that says hey i like 8% interest rates right because why, why? man because it gets the problem what happens a lot of times is we're so good as agents helping everybody else that we forget to help ourselves right and that's the saddest part of this whole equation hey everyone thanks so much for tuning in for another podcast today i have a treat today with me i have the king the goat of the real estate in chicago andrew holmes you know one of the most often asked questions well andrew where do i start or even better how do i fast track my success like big multifamilies is very exciting the reason i don't talk about it that much is it's not the most profitable market sector uh thank you andrew so much for your time thank, thank you. you i'm blessed to be here man coming in today for those who maybe don't know you probably there's not a lot of people those who are in real estate probably know you but maybe just give us a little bit about you so people get to know you so briefly started out as a real estate agent age of 19 uh started doing flips at the age of 32 35 years old started buying rental properties today I have a portfolio of about 260 and counting properties property cash flowing cash all flowing about 115,000 net a month wow i remember uh at 2000 probably 16 yeah. i went into your uh uh event uh, sure. seminar uh-huh. and your goal i think was at that point 100,000 net 100,000 net at yeah, that time. I remember yeah. that goal. So yeah. now you exceeded it. I exceeded now it. Now you have yeah. a new goal. I have a new one, yeah. Uh, what is it? 250 a month, net. So you started as an agent in 19 yeah. and then you were selling until 32. Yeah, it's I was uh in college was not doing too well because <laughs> I was I always went, wanted to do something in business, right? And real estate obviously kept coming up. This is I'm yeah. dating myself now. This is before you had access to YouTube and all this stuff. So I'd read books, right? My friends were partying and I was reading books at the library. So I was always that odd guy. I went to college to figure out how do I become rich. I mean, I did not go to college to get a job. The problem was, man, that you ask your guidance counselor, "Hey, is like what do you want to do?" I'm like, "Well, I'm broke. Yeah. I left India telling my parents, "Hey, I'm going to be a multimillionaire, and here I am struggling." And you know, sometimes what happens is you grow up with parents that have uh big shoes to fill and if you feel you're not living up to the expectations it puts you in a very odd spot so that was me right not doing too well in college because i just was not interested you went to college here yeah west virginia university and then you went back to india no 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 i was i was born here grew up in india all my life right and then, and then you came went... back 11th grade high school uh huh yeah. and then you went into real estate started yeah so i uh... took my pell grant and i bought a course licensing course yeah for state of west virginia at the time and uh, i became a real estate agent and then that was and how did you do you you were successful i was struggling man i was i had <laughs> a thick indian accent i still obviously have a little bit of it but it was funny because we had 111 agents in town i'll never forget this <laughs> and i used to cold call people so yeah. i had gotten somebody's tapes floyd wickman or one of those yeah, yeah. Uh, sales <laughs> trainers right and he's like you call people and say hey i'll sell your house for free like literally and i was so nervous i would forget my own name So I'd write it down on a piece of paper and I'd call all these farmers and like boy you got to be the dumbest real estate agent I know <laughs> cuz why would you sell my house for free I mean <laughs> I didn't know what to do right and I was desperate I didn't want to tell my parents that I quit school because that's like a for an Indian family that's like the biggest shame right your son quit school and both my parents yeah. were surgeons right surgeons yeah and so and your son quit school so this is like you're going to bring shame to the family. So that yeah. was it was not it was a rocky start to say the least. So But down there proud, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was fortunate, you know, sometimes uh it's like what do they say, right? When you when the student is ready, the teacher will appear, that yeah. sort of thing. And uh I went to a Mike Ferry seminar. Mm-hmm. A lot of people may know that name in the industry. Yeah. Um big huge sales trainer for real estate agents. And uh, I mean, when I say I was broke I literally didn't even have the 4 500 to be able to pay for it and uh, sometimes you know life humbles you I r- remember running my credit card at the door and it didn't go through and literally like 
I'm like 19, 20 years old, you want to cry. Like, yeah. But you're obviously, uh, you're ashamed of yourself, right? Uh, to be in that position. And I remember there was a lady by the name of Miss Kathy and uh, she changed my life because she let me, she's like, you know, it's okay. It's probably the, you know, it's a security thing. Yeah. It wasn't <laughs> a security thing, man. It was like, I didn't have the money, right? I mean, I, that was the truth. But she's like, you know, Mike said it's okay. And mm. she said, let me sit in the front row. And all weekend long, I kept avoiding her because I was so ashamed of myself, right? I couldn't afford to go to the lunchroom with everybody else because it's some big fancy Marriott in Pittsburgh and I didn't have the $40, right? But it's interesting how things happen because everybody had nice cars. I had this beat up Mustang, the paint was peeled off. And I remember this uh, because I slept in the car mm. and I had a change of clothes. I went to the gym mm -hmm. and it was like $8 to pay for, like to go take a shower, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, sometimes they say, you know, it's a character building experience. So mm. that was my, I guess, character building experience was, uh, but I mean, like literally that was the start. So. And then you started, uh, you went through the course, you started cold calling. I mean, rest was history because um, he said, hey, here's a script. And yeah. I literally Use it. took the index cards and I would just every day, I, three, four hours, I would call people, just expires, FISBOs, cancel listings every single day. You got some business? You were I got a lot of business. Lot I mean, business. I got a lot of business. I did a lot of experiments. A lot of um, agents don't want to do that, you know? A lot of agents don't want to do that. No, I mean, still, I, they, it's just something that's been, everybody knows about it. But no, I mean, every, wants to do it. you know, it's like everybody used to laugh at me at the office. Yeah. Right? Everybody used to laugh. They weren't laughing six, eight months down the road. Yeah. Right? And uh, because I was getting listings. Right? Yeah. I mean, literally, first listing, I, did, I would do open house for everybody. And it just happens to be that somebody walks in and buys a house from the open house. What are the odds? Yeah. Right? This is my first sale. Yeah. And I had told the owner that, hey, if you list with me, I'll do an open house. Anybody comes to an open house, uh, you don't have to pay me anything. Yeah. I mean, the guy was a lawyer. He felt so bad for me <laughs> that he gave me 500 bucks, right? Yeah. Uh, the brokerage took 100 bucks and 400 bucks. I mean, that was gas money I didn't have. I mean, so... Uh, it was not a good start because mind you, all this time, I'm trying to avoid telling uh, my parents so I don't necessarily have money. I'm at Remax because they say we pay 100% commissions mm -hmm. at the time, right? And I and I was they're number one. So I wanted to be number one. So I was that guy that always had these grandiose ideas. I quite didn't know how to put them into practice at the time. So I also, when I started in, uh, I started, I'll tell you, uh, I started in 2017 <clears throat> and the same day when I start getting into real estate, I was at your seminar. I got my license. Oh, no kidding. I, li I got my license. This wow. is the day I passed my test. And then your seminar was uh, uh, at that same day. Wow. So I went to your seminar. We sat in a room. And then uh, it was a smaller room. And then you say, one by one, we're, uh, stand up and sell, sure. say something about right. you. So I, w I stood up and I said, I got my real estate license. I want to buy my first property this right. year. <laughs> I remember that day. It was like, And then I went into Stino's office. Yeah, Century absolutely. 21. Yeah. And I, same thing, I started cold calling. Yeah. Uh, went into for sale by owners, expired. Uh, didn't get too much business. I started doing videos after that. Mm -hmm. And so videos got me going pretty good. And that's how yeah, I, I've the been name growing. There, but, right? but yeah, with, uh, uh, with your seminars, the fir very, very, very first time I met you, um, I remember you walking into that room and it was in Schomburg. And you were doing, uh, you were talking, there were some guys coming in on the panel sharing their ideas sure. about what they were yeah. selling. And I remember, like, whoa! I was still in the trucking business. Okay, uh, I was. It. I had a couple of trucks that were moving around the country. You're Polish, by heritage. Uh, Ukrainian. Ukrainian. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, You're European. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I did that a little bit, but that didn't like the challenges the bro the industry brought. So I I was looking for some uh, something else. And I remember you were talking about investing and buying properties. I used to live in a rental in Elsa. Okay, <laughs> I was yeah. renting yeah. a okay. condo South, in Elsa. South suburbs. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I thought, oh, investing so good. And I, you, you had this, uh, the little uh, USB thumb that you gave out. Sure. And I plugged in it and there was a list of properties that are pre-foreclosures or something. Right. And I went and like, whoa, I can make so much money because you had some numbers there. Yeah. And I'm like, whoa, how do I do this? This was like, I remember this day. Like, I, I can remember like probably every single thought that was going through my mind back then. But then since like it was 20, probably 16, today is 2023, right. like seven years ago, the first time I met you, you know? Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, we've all come a long way. Yeah. Right? You started investing. Uh, you stopped selling. 
so 20, 20, I guess I mean, there were a couple of steps, right? Yeah. Um, so in uh, so at some point I moved to Atlanta because I'm like, oh, I want to move to a oh. bigger town, right? And in Atlanta, I was always looking for what's next, what's next, because as I was doing pretty decent with real estate, the problem was I wanted a vehicle to be able to make cash flow. Right. And I met somebody and he's like, he was in the gas station business, right? Oh, I remember and, that. Uh, I heard that. Yeah, so I... Uh, basically, he's like, well, if you can find a piece of property where we can put a gas station, as long as the foot traffic is good and a mixed neighborhood, uh, that's where you make the most money, mm-hmm. the gas station business. I didn't know anything about it. So every day I was selling real estate, um, and then I used to work at a bar in the evening. And after I got off, I would drive through different neighborhoods. I basically broke the city, city down into eight different sections, mm-hmm. and I would drive through every different section and then I realized that you didn't make money selling fuel. You made money selling lottery tickets. At the time, cigarettes was a yeah. lot of money. And you made um, a, a lot of money with, I'm sorry? Snacks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like kind of in-store sort of thing, right? And so, but the two things uh, were cigarettes and lottery tickets. Yeah. That's where the big revenue was really? at that time. And uh, I find a piece of land at the time. And this was my first investment. I had read a book called No Money Down, Robert Allen wrote this book, and it basically talks about getting a land contract and getting a piece of property under contract. Mm -hmm. So the seller had this property, and it was a corner lot. It was a big piece of property. It was about almost a six-acre piece. But nobody could use it because of the kind of the location. It was too much traffic in and out, but it was across from a Ford plant, kind of on the other side of the highway, and the egress and ingress into the property, that's where the main ramp was. And there was only one ramp where you could get off and on off the, uh, onto the highway, I should say. So <laughs> I got that property under contract. Um, and at the time, we realized that you could sign a contract with Phillips Conoco, the gas station uh, mm-hmm. in the South, the gas company in the South. You sign a 10-year contract, and they would build the canopy, and they would put the tanks mm-hmm. in for you, which was the major expense. Mm-hmm. And the rest of it, we could finance it. Mm-hmm. So basically, I had never done it, so the bank was not going to give me a loan. He... Uh, this friend of mine uh, who had made friends with, he already had a couple of gas stations. He's like, okay, you found the property. The property will make money. I'm like, are you sure? Because <laughs> I took every credit card. By this time, at least I could get a little bit of credit. So every credit card ran up everyone to come up with my part of it, right? Um, the money we needed. And um, basically we were in business. And uh, it's like sometimes, you know, what happens in life is um, – a fool and his money are soon parted, right? <laughs> and I was the fool. And um, so at 22, 23 years old, I'm making like net every month, 23, 24,000 bucks uh-huh. a month, mm-hmm. right? And that's uh, a lot of money. Uh, yeah, that was a lot of money, mm-hmm. right? That was a lot of money. And this is before 2001, right? It, I mean, that was a lot of money at that time. I'm like, yeah. I buy two, three cars for cash. I'm like, oh, man, I'm doing good. I buy a house, don't have a lot of debt. Because I came from the old school of thought that, hey, I'm not going to put a lot of debt. One mistake I had made, which sometimes you make missteps, you don't mean to, but I did. I had put the gas station, my part of it, in my own name. Mm. And not realizing I did not put it in an LLC. I didn't have an S-Corp. He had an S-Corp because he was signing the loan. Mm -hmm. And um, about five months into it, I'll never forget this. Three o'clock in the morning, I still remember the sergeant's name. I get a call from the sergeant. His name is Sergeant Ebb, right? Big barrel-chested guy. If somebody got foolish at the gas station, he was always very nice to us. And uh, he calls me, and he was always that guy that was like the tough guy, right? And his voice is breaking, like almost like he wants to cry because I'd made friends with him, right? Mm-hmm. I'd made really good friends with him. He was just a nice, nice, nice man. And he's like, Andrew, you got to come to the gas station. Right now, uh, I'm not in the habit of getting a call from a cop three o'clock in the morning. Right, right, <laughs> and clearly I knew something was wrong. Right, and um, I'll never forget till this day. There's a highway called 400 in Atlanta. I'm driving down it, and I couldn't get on the ramp because the ramp was closed, and uh, and I could see smoke going right. up, and it's the longest probably an hour uh, that I drove. Uh, I mean, excuse me, a mile that I drove around to get to the gas station. And what had happened was somebody had overdosed 
and they had driven one of those Cadillac Broms, the big, huge, mm-hmm. old cars, straight into the gas station at about 55 miles an hour. And the whole thing went up in smokes. Wow. The issue wasn't the gas station. The issue was what came of it, which was a personal liability lawsuit because we only had a million and a half coverage on it. Mm-hmm. Insurance company basically gave their part, but they left me out of it because I had the gas station, my ownership of it was in my personal name. Is that a big lesson here? For That's a big lesson. Because doing a business, everything under LLC? Sometimes, you know, you know how much it was to set up an LLC at that time in, at, in Georgia? $72, yeah. right? That's the most expensive $72 that I never spent mm. because that cost me. So I didn't, a bunch of people were like, oh, just do bankruptcy, right? Yeah. And I was, I was going to ask, time, did you go bankrupt? No, I, at the time, I didn't know what bankruptcy exactly meant, right? And I felt ashamed. And mind you, at this time, I'm not telling my parents. I'm mm-hmm. only telling them the good stuff. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God, I'm making all this money, blah, blah, blah. And my parents, old school parents, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Our son talks too much, <laughs> right? I mean, that kind of thing, right? And uh, it's interesting when you think you just hit the new low, which was um, I settled with them, which is I had to get rid of my cars, get rid of the house, whatever the profit was, hey, here it is, and that's that. So the sheriff shows up. You give the keys. How old were you? You, I was 23, mm. I think, 23 at the time. Mm. And uh, I walk out. And it's interesting how things happen. A week and a half later, my mom and my sister were coming to town from India. And I made up every lie and every excuse in the book why this was not a good time to come to Atlanta. <laughs> right? Um, I mean, today, it's like we can sit back, laugh about it. Right? At the time, I had no place to live. Right? I had no place to go and how am I supposed to put up my mom and here I was the guy who was telling her how proud she should be and blah 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 because I'd always tried to kind of fill these big shoes that I thought my parents always had and here I am suddenly go from boom and again I quit selling real estate because I'm like hey I'm rich man why would I sell real estate? So you estate? quit while so you I were quit doing the well, guest station you know business. sometimes you have to have a good solid plan B why the, solid, the plan A is working. Yeah. I was doing pretty well in real estate. I should have kept that going and built this on the side. But you, were, you wouldn't have time. I actually had time. I didn't you run did? the place. We had good employees. I went there, counted money, deposited it. It was pretty good. Mm. Right? It was, it was you had really, a lot of free time. Yeah? I had a lot of free time. Should have kept right? selling. I, I should have kept selling real estate at the time. It was interesting because sometimes, you know, we've all had those moments where our parents don't call us on our shit. And that was one of those moments. My mom and sister came in town. They stayed at a hotel. My mom never asked me one question, mm. right? She never said it. We laughed about it later. Uh, but at the time, she clearly knew something was going on, right? And uh, I never said anything about it. But, I mean, that's literally in 2002 is how I ended up in Chicago, right? Oh, you went to Chicago. Yeah, I right came to Chicago that. in 2002. Two. And Started I was selling to, again. Yeah, no, but I, f- I was a server. There's a Westin on El Genohan Expressway, down the street from us, <laughs> where we are right now. <laughs> and I you used to be a steakhouse there called Shula Steakhouse. And I used to be a server at that Shula Steakhouse. I mean, that was literally my start in real... I mean, and then in the morning, basically, during the day, I was trying to get listings, yeah. trying to sell real estate. And my biggest fear was I had a bunch of listings that I'll grow village. And that, oh, my God, one of my sellers or clients is going to come for dinner at that Chula Steakhouse, yeah, yeah. right? And it's like, hey, man, it was an honest day's living. I was, I was not doing anything wrong. But my own self-esteem was so low yeah. that I felt bad about where I was at that time in my life, you know. But that was what it was. So yeah. it was an interesting. So you kept selling from 2002 to 2007. Eight. About eight, 2008 or so. Yeah, when the yeah. crash happened. Yeah. Did you, when the crash happened, was that like a green light for you? Were you waiting? Were you always thinking about, I'm going to go into investment? Or is that something that the opportunity showed up, the sales dropped? Like, wh- how did that come about? Why did you start it? Like, was that something you were still? I was always, I always was. See, what real estate an, sales was good. But you me. never thought about this as a long-term play I, for you? Yeah, I never thought about being a real estate agent, agent as a long-term path. Yes, okay. Right? As a long-term path, I never thought about it. Yeah. I got into real estate sales as a means to make the next step. 
Yeah. Right. I knew real estate sales could make good money. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's not too many professions where nobody asks you how much education you have. Yeah. What if you're willing to put your nose down and go to work? Right. I mean, one of the hardest jobs you're ever going to do is real estate agent, mm-hmm. but it can make you a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, there's not too many professions you can make three, four, five hundred thousand bucks. Sure. Right. And with one part time assistant, I was making three hundred thousand bucks and taking almost every penny home. Mm-hmm. Right. Meaning I wasn't spending a lot of money. Because purely every day I was doing cold calls. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I I hated it. Mm. I hated it with a passion because I couldn't control my destiny. That's really what I didn't like about being a real estate agent. Not that the business was a great business. I mean, I would not be here if I had not sold real estate, 100%. And what it did was it laid a foundation for investing, mm-hmm. right? Because when I started doing flips in 2008, and I was looking in 2003, 4, 5, and each year I would try to save a little bit of money, but each year the market just kept going through the roof. Yeah. Right. Two thousand four, like right five, now. six. It was just crazy. Like right now. Yeah, absolutely. No, <laughs> qu- no question about it. How right? is that feeling right now versus that? Is I it think crazy today. Now? Well, today it is crazy. Again, there's a lot of people doing crazy things. Yeah. But still, I don't think it's anywhere close to where it was mm. in terms of how many crazy loans people were doing in terms of no-doc loans, like ninja loans, ninja no loans. income, no job, no uh, verification mm-hmm. loans at that time. And if you look at the number of expires at the time, the reason I had a leg up compared to everybody else was 2006, I saw the number of expires every day go up. Mm. One day it's 100, next day it's 120, 130, 140. And so what was happening was the pile of expires was growing. And the only reason they weren't selling for one reason, they were mispriced, meaning the prices were gradual and nobody could see it mm. because nice properties were still selling. So you couldn't tell that the market was bad. The yeah. only way you could tell market was changing was if you knew amount of expires versus amount of actives. And as that grows, you're like, oh my God, yeah. there's something happening. And each day I would look that more and more expires were happening compared to the net number of sales, mm-hmm. right? I mean, what we call a cum of inventory, right? Uh, that was growing. Mm -hmm. And that's where for the first time I started realizing that there's something here, right? And I was ready. I mean, literally January 14th, 2008, I'll never forget it. 705 Morton. I still remember the address in Hoffman Estates. That was the first house I ever flipped, right? How did you buy it? I bought it with $20,000 I borrowed from Chase Bank Uh as a home equity loan. And on your primary residence? On my primary residence. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had another friend of mine who was a wealthy guy who had a cigar store. And we would talk. And um, I got him to invest with me because I thought he was a successful business guy. And I didn't want to tell him. I was scared. Yeah. Right? So I was like, hey, man, if he thinks it's a great idea. Because everybody was like, hey, everybody's running for the hills. And you're investing. This is stupid. And I was like, no, now is the time to get in. Right? And literally, he was like, okay, man, I'll put 20000 in. Let's see what happens. I'm like, I'll, I'll do all the work. I'll find the property. I'll get, find the people to get it rehabbed, and I'll sell it. I won't charge any commission. And literally, first 123 transactions, I did, did exact that way, and I gave him. He made a $25,000 investment, and I gave him $2.5 million back. Wow. So You made money on all the flips? No. I mean, I can't. So, you and know, the first if I one, look on back. On the first one. First one, I made 20000 bucks, but not including my commission. If I had actually charged myself, I barely made 15000 bucks. Uh-huh. So, yeah. you know, but that was a start. But now that I look back, and 2008, I did 10 flips. 2009, I did 30. 2010, I did 60. And what I realized was I was going back in the same pattern, which is as a real estate agent, yeah. I had a treadmill I ran on. Yeah. As a flipper, quote unquote, I had a treadmill that I was running on harder. Mm -hmm. And people around me were like, oh my God, you're killing it, man. I'm like, I'm not killing anything. I'm killing myself. Mm -hmm. Because the truth was, of the 66 flips that I had done in those three years, I made less than 13,000. In the 33 flips that I did, I made 60,000 or more per flip. Mm -hmm. So why did I do the 66 flips? Right. Because 33 are the ones that really made real money. Yeah. What I was doing was, what probably one of the biggest lessons I learned was that most of the flips I should have been saying no to and I was saying yes to mm-hmm. because I thought the money was in the volume. Mm-hmm. It's all about quality, not co- quantity most of the times. Mm-hmm. 
But you can also, can you systemize the flipping business so it's business that you can step out of or no? You cannot. You cannot. I mean, a lot of people have tried it. I have never met anybody that has systematized the business to the There's, level to the level where they truly have a high net. Yeah. You can systematize the business to do a lot of volume, but in the end, you're not going to have anything to show for it. I mean, you're much better off selling real estate. It's much less work. You'll be much more lucrative. If somebody said today, oh, man, I want to make a quarter million bucks or half million bucks, sell real estate, 100%. Wow. No, do not do flips. No. Do flips one or two when the right ones come along. Yeah. That's it. Because a couple good flips, three good flips will make you 150,000 bucks. Didn't you just do a flip in one prospect? I just, yeah, I just did. I saw flip. the video on YouTube. Yeah. You're all over the place. I just, so yeah. I just saw no, the video I mean, with the kitchen, nice kitchen. Yeah. So, I mean, Morton Grove, actually. Oh, uh, Morton Grove. Yeah, Morton Grove. Grove. I mean, uh. but that's an easy, simple flip. Yeah. Remove one wall, kitchen, bathrooms, and boom, and we made 82,000 bucks. But you have to be very picky on the ones that you do, right? Yeah. A lot of times, I mean, you deal with this all the time. Flipping is, well, you buy it low, you fix it, you sell it high. Yeah. The problem is there's a lot of nuances in every business, sure. right? And those nuances is where the devil is in the details. So, but 2010, I quit doing flips. I mean, quit as in cut it down, I guess. You so transition to buy and hold. Buy and holds, yeah. So basically the model at that time was uh, two flips, one hold, two flips, one hold. And then it kind of flipped because that's when we started doing the whole 257 model. Right. Two years, five properties, get them paid down in seven. I got a question. Yeah. Why would you pay them down? So here was the thought process. It's actually a very good question. A lot of times people don't realize because logic would suggest that, hey, if you have good properties, why pay them down? Just to basically keep scaling up. So at the time, what we know today, we didn't know at that time. Mm -hmm. I think where the market was 2011, 12, we couldn't get any 30-year fixed loans, mm -hmm. right? So where the market was, you did a five-year balloon loan with a 25-year amortization. Mm -hmm. So what would happen is, what if the balloon, when the balloon came due in five years, what if the rates were 10, 12, 15%? I right. didn't want to be like all the in people the I saw around. Yeah. So my calculation was that, hey man, for every five properties that I have, if three or four are paid down, then I can easily, even if the interest rates go up, everybody else is going to be in trouble and I'll be able to make the notes. I won't ever have to look back. And my idea when I started doing rentals were very simple. I wanted $3,000 a month in cash flow, Yeah. right? I mean, that was my simple goal and I wanted to own two or three houses free and clear, right? I was like, if I can get there, because that was more than anybody I saw at right. the time. So, Stino once told me in the beginning, I just right. got into the business. He said, if you have five houses, it will change your life. I'm never going to forget it. I was like, oh, I want to change my life. I need five places. 100%. And I, yeah. Right? And Mr. Stino has done that, right? Right. 100%. He's, yeah, he's, uh, I don't know how much he's total right now, but he's over 100, I think, units. Yeah. Um, but um, I'm doing, uh, I was start. I started with condos. You right. don't like condos. So, no, I I actually did start with condos. I started with oh. townhouses. townhouses. I didn't like t condos with a hallway. That was my mm. big thing. Because like where you are, the density is higher. Like if mm. you take in Chicago, as we talk about northwest part of Chicago or in Chicago, Chicago, your density is higher. There the condos sell. Uh, but in my market, which was Schaumburg and surrounding market, Hanover Park, Hoffman Estates, Glendale Heights, condos with a hallway did not sell. So if you had a single entrance condo, meaning like a four unit building and you own one of them, or yeah. if you have individual condo units, then it was fine, mm -hmm. but no hallways. So because, see, I knew those stats from the selling. Mm -hmm. Because every if you took up, like I'll give you a perfect example, Arlington Heights, yeah. great suburb, but condos with long hallways, they would sit on the market forever. So I would sure. never take those listings mm -hmm. because whenever I was selling real estate, my approach was similar to investing. I was only selling properties at the time between 100000 and three fifty, because those properties would turn the quickest. Mm -hmm. And that market was the easiest for me to penetrate, right? So I took, and this this idea came from Mike. He's like, listen, sell bread and butter properties, yes. just do a large volume yes. and you can turn them. So, and there's plenty of them to break up and in, go into a higher niche. You're going to have to do too much work. It's not worth it. So I use that same principle for flips. I use that same principle for rentals, uh, middle market, not the low market, not the high market. The mid part is where you can make the most money. So you feel like it's okay to start with condos to invest? Oh, 100%. In, yeah, you, 100%. Are you okay with HOAs? I'm a okay with it. I don't like them because yeah. they can be an absolute pain in the ass, but 
It could uh, be, yeah. It's perfect. I mean, you can make money. That's how I started. Yeah. Uh, some some investors don't like HOA. Just just right. this, just this whole principle of right. uh, having somebody over you, I guess. Right. You know. Right. But see, I was looking at scaling. Yeah. Right? I mean, I realized if I can do five, I can do ten. And once I got to five thousand bucks net a month, I was like, oh my god, I can do ten a month. Yeah. Then it was twenty. Then was, uh, I hadn't met too many people that were doing the smaller properties that I had to do mm -hmm. because I didn't have a lot of capital. I mean, quite honestly, the thing was that every time I did a flip, I made money, but then if I put that into a property and if I can't refinance it, I mean, hence the whole idea of the 257 idea that every time um, I buy a property, it has to have 25, 30% equity. Yeah. It has to have cash flow 350 to $500 net a month, right? And it has to hit a DCR number of 1.33 so that I can refinance out mm -hmm. and still have a lot of equity. And I have 100% always kind of held to that principle. And then I can scale up because I didn't want to go to areas that were tough areas, right? Mm -hmm. I have a small body and a big mouth. <laughs> so I'm not going to go areas where I can get held up or shot or something. That's not my business plan. And I mean, uh, <laughs> and I and never did. I wanted to buy good quality areas that were bread and butter. I couldn't afford Schomburg, so I'd buy Hanover Park, Streamwood, uh, Hoffman Estates at the time, and uh, that plan has worked. You stick to singles, right? Singles, two unit, up to four units. Why not six and higher? I would buy them, like I'm buying a property right now in uh, Hyde Park in Chicago. It's cl 21 units. How, what's but the price per unit, roughly? Price per unit is 50,000. It's low. It's, it's really low. Wow. That's the reason because the back end on that is 170 a unit. Hyde Park, yeah? Hyde Park, yeah. And it's it's literally Cash two long, blocks it's, uh, from Chicago, easy uh, to rent University of that. Chicago. Yeah. I mean, literally two blocks, wow. right? And so for the right number, I would buy them, right? My problem with multifamily is a lot of people buy them based on cap rate only. What would you do the nine flat in uh, Harwood Heights for 1.3? Would you do it? Depending on the numbers, depending on the number of bedrooms, depending on the number of cash flow. Really, I mean, it's to me, it's all about net, net, bottom line. I have to create a cash flow. I'm not going to buy a property. That breaks even. There's no way. No way. There's, I mean, you couldn't give it away to me. I mean, 50, <laughs> $50 a month a door, I'm not buying it. How about, a how about like cap uh, 4.5%? There's no way. No way. <laughs> There's no way. A I mean, plus, no. neighborhood, A plus. That's just not my business model. Right. That it's a business model for some people that works. Mm -hmm. See, I buy properties that are distressed. Even with multi-units, I'm buying properties uh, that are distressed. I'm creating equity in them, and I want large amount of equity, right? I mean, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, at one point, I bought a four-unit building in Berwyn, mm -hmm. right? At that time, I paid 200000 for it at that time. And when it was all said and done, the appraisal was three fifty, right? Yet, I had to leave 50000 in the building when I did a refi mm -hmm. because my appraisal at that time came a little short. Mm -hmm. um, just that was kind of the appraiser. Now, even though every single month that building made $1,800 net a month, after all expenses, I still had to leave 50000 in the building, right? Because I'm getting 75% of 350 in terms of uh, uh, refi out. How am I going to buy more buildings if I keep leaving 50000 per building? Sure. Because, and so my idea was that, and the issue was this, how many months did it take me to rehab that? It took me close to 13 months, right. right? Now, number one, I didn't know what I was doing because mm -hmm. I, didn't, I hadn't dealt with older buildings. And so my idea was, at the same time, how many properties could I have bought that were single families? Question, do you still like the properties that need work or would you buy the one that don't need work? No, I mean, I 100% buy properties that need work. Need I work. don't buy anything with fire damage. I don't buy anything. Mold is okay. I won't buy uh, properties where you have to do additions, and I don't buy any properties where I have to do second stories. Mm -hmm. I want to do, time. yeah, too much time. Yeah. If I have to basically do any sort of a architectural drawing, simple architectural drawings, mm -hmm. some villages require that around yeah. Chicago, that's okay. But I don't want to, I want to buy a property 800 to 1300, 1400 square feet generally, uh, three bedrooms, one and a half baths. Now today we're buying bigger properties, meaning about 2,000, 2,500 square feet for Airbnb and midterm rentals, mm. which is a very recent phenomenon. But I mean, I've noticed your content on YouTube. Yeah. You're tapping into Airbnb yeah. lately, big time, big, big time. time, big time. Like you shifting the whole thing. Not the whole thing, 
Uh, but a lot of the properties, see what it has done is we can buy A area properties. Mm. I can buy the Schomburg, the Morton Groves, Park Ridge, um, all the nice, the wheelings of the world mm -hmm. uh, because I'm getting, I'll give you a perfect example. And these are MLS properties, mind you. Elwood mm. Park, I just bought a property on Fletcher, uh, 210 buy price. It's a bungalow for 210. 60,000 rehab. Mm -hmm. On the back end, even with today's interest rates, my payments would be $2,300, $2,400 maximum, mm -hmm. right? And I could get 3,500 bucks on a regular rental, regular rental. Right. So you would net cash flow thousand. after expenses a thousand bucks, mm -hmm. right? On a midterm rental, because you can't do a short term rental there. On a midterm rental, I just signed a contract, $5,800. Okay, wait. So midterm is like who? Midterm who? is 30 days plus. Who's renting like that? It's who nurses, needs? doctors, people uh -huh. coming to town. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, people, somebody's property burns down, somebody is moving mm -hmm. to the area, and they're looking for a house, and there's not much available, right? And especially in good areas. Like Barrington is a perfect example. I'm uh, doing one in Barrington. They don't, do not allow, absolutely do not allow, and they've taken people to court for short-term rentals. They, they uh, like... Mid-term rentals, perfectly fine. Mid-term, perfect. perfectly fine. So you have to go to the village for the, the you Airbnb have to check. stuff? You have to check. Yeah. Like, I did I that, see. and I've tried, I mean, like all of us, right? We push the limits. I did that in Melrose Park, right? They Of all the pay people, the mayor's secretary calls me, she's like, Andrew, what's wrong with you, hmm. right? And I'm like, hey, I had to give it a try, yeah. right? But the problem is, <laughs> what I've realized is it's better to work with the system yeah. rather than try to work against the system because it's it's pretty lucrative there. Right? It's really lucrative. I mean, on a midterm, I would rather do midterms than Airbnbs any day of the week. Any right. day of the week. Because you don't have turnover, number one, very low turnover, quality people. But you need the management. Management, I pay 15%. To, uh, there's a company that there's do that. Company, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. There's a company, yeah. There's a company, we're setting up something local in-house now mm, right. because um, we're paying out 15%, but then I don't have to do anything. It's even better than rentals. Right, because rentals we manage in house. So, what are your plans to get rid of rentals? Um, no, 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 no. I'm not selling anything. So I'm not a seller. Man. Diversify. You're yeah, not. I mean, I don't like. I mean, of the all the rentals I've ever bought, I have sold two, mm. ever. Right. I do not like to sell properties at mm. all. Right. So. Uh, what's the biggest uh, so far? You big into auctions, right? For the source yeah. of uh, income, uh, mm -hmm. like a uh, source of properties that you sure. buy. You, yeah. you, you, like the uh, auctions is the biggest for you. No, actually, it's wholesalers not. I mean, of. No, it's MLS. Really? I mean, of all the properties I've ever bought, 100% MLS is 60% of inventory. Mm. 100%. Right? I love that. I mean, again, see, I come from an agent background, right? So I know how to use the MLS. Yeah. I know uh, I love agents. See, right? Th th there you go. You know, everybody's looking for where's no. the deal. They're no, there. I mean, I can guarantee it. And, and I'll give you an exact example of this. Last year... Um, I was behind this whole thing about wholesales, 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 right? Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I spent $160,000 last year running TV ads, doing mailings, doing all the stuff you can think of, PP, uh, you know, PPC, yeah. um, all the stuff. And I bought a lot of good properties. Not, I didn't. But if I look at the total spend versus mm -hmm. the properties bought mm -hmm. versus the properties missed, mm -hmm. I would still go back. I went back to MLS this year. Mm. I mean, some of the best properties I've owned, because what happens is this, that at the end of the day, uh, probably the best source of leads for me are real estate agents. I love real estate agents, and I will never undercut anybody's commission. And I'm yes. happy. I mean, even agents, I'll give you a perfect example, Frank Bontro from Southside, yeah. right? I've called him at times, hey, man, there's a property coming up. I don't know what's the value, right? He's like, bro, it's 360. I'm buying at 200. Mm. I, the South Side is not my market, like South, South Side of Chicago. But if I can buy the property, I'm happy to give him the listing. Hey, sell it for me, right? And I've sent him checks. He's like, what is the check for? I'm like, well, I appreciate your knowledge mm. because I would have never made $160,000 was it not for your knowledge. I'm paying you four to make hundred. I mean, the heck, yeah. right? I mean, and a lot of times people are, even investors are short-sighted. They'll become an agent and then they'll undercut their agent out. I mean, yeah. it makes no sense to me, mm. right? Hey man, good be good to agents because they're your best source of deals. Now, yeah. if you have MLS access because you have a license, God bless you. Yeah. But there is no way I would ever because all you, I need is every agent to give me one deal a year, man. Yeah. Right? right. I mean, 20, 30 good agents will make my year, right? Some good properties because and 
you have to kind of look at a business that we're all here to make a buck. I mean, let's just, we're all running a business, right? So why would, I mean, if you're working hard for me, why would I not be loyal to you? So if you're sending me the property, I just, in fact, literally as, as I was pulling in your parking lot, mm -hmm. at an agent, I just bought a property from in Westchester, MLS property. Mm -hmm. Back in value is 315. For a property, and they thought the plumbing would need 24,000 bucks. I'm paying 3,000 bucks to get the plumbing fixed. Mm -hmm. $175,000, a 3-2 in Westchester. I own the house next to it. I own the house across from it. I own the house behind it, right? And man, this agent is worth his weight in gold yes, to me. For sure. Why would I ever, and the property he's referring me into is another MLS property, right? So easily I can go uh, you know, around him, but there's no way I'd do that because uh, guess who's calling? He's calling now. Right. Right. Because I want to be good to the person. Uh, it's short sighted sometimes, I think, how investors think that, oh, I'm going to become an agent mm -hmm. and cut agents out. That's I think that's the silliest thing to do. I remember I uh, one time uh, last year so, or something, I had uh, four houses for sale in Lansing. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a guy, he wanted he wanted to sell everything and uh, move to other state. And uh, from Ria, I got so many calls. Yeah. <clears throat> Lansing is one of Lansing's. your. <clears throat> and in Lansing, out of the group that uh, we have. Farah called me. Yeah. For, yeah. We own close to 410 houses in Lansing alone. 400? 410. Wow. <laughs> so here's, here's something funny, right? Um, and it, this is something for real estate agents, right? Average in, uh, if you look at the average population, about 9% of people own uh, rental properties. Mm -hmm. You know, real estate agents, it's less than 3%. Crazy. Crazy. I don't, I don't get right? it. We're in the business. We're in one of the best businesses in the world. Yeah. And we don't buy our own product. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is, which doesn't make any sense to doesn't me. Doesn't make, for me, uh, I always keep saying it. It's like a buying a Mercedes for somebody who drives Honda. Yeah. Like it doesn't make sense. Right. No, you can't no, sell I mean, it to it, yourself. You want to sell just, it to it's, me? It's interesting because it's, so we have a group of about now 1,200 people in Chicago, right? Uh, that come to these events and all this kind of stuff and that are part of the, this group that uh, I have. And they own about 19,000 rentals in Chicago. 19,000. I mean, think about how yeah. massive these numbers are. Yeah. Right? Like it's a whole and, city. Uh, I mean, it's exciting, man, because yeah. every town you go to, it's like now I started buying these planes. Right? Um, and I, I mean, it's exciting. Did you, did you see the Pratt Avenue? Uh, Pratt. I did not. Pratt. Pratt Avenue, is that the property? 180. I think I went there. I think the I the corner, the corner building with the big land. No, it I needs a lot that. of work. No, no. it keep, keeps going up and uh, going under contract, and then keeps bouncing back. Okay, it's uh, uh yeah, it's probably tear tear down. You got to build. Down, yeah. yeah, next yeah. to the close to the high uh, train and the uh, airport. Okay, so it's a little bit of a yeah. So building we're doing down in Florida. We were talking be mm -hmm. before we got started. Yeah, so we're doing building down in the Florida market. So. Building for Airbnb. For Airbnb, I mean, long-term rentals. Why Florida? So what I wanted was a market which was uh, the opposite of Illinois, right? Meaning that, see, I'm not a, I'm not one of those people that, oh, my God, leave Illinois and it's bad. Yeah, uh -huh. do we have challenges? 100%. Mm -hmm. In Chicago, we have Today challenges. is election day. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, we have an interesting clim political climate. But if you look at Chicago is the number one town in terms of cash flow. Mm. meaning the relation of the pricing versus what you can collect on rent. See, a lot of times people look at it, they'll say yeah. Austin, they'll look at Phoenix, they look at certain areas. Oh my God, no, how can you say that, Andrew? It's not, see, if can you buy a property in Dallas or Phoenix or Houston at the prices we can buy it for versus the rent? It's that ratio, which is the highest in Chicago. And it's the largest. And lately, cut. it's been even crazier. It's been crazy. Like rents are like, it's, I don't even know what the rents are. out of the roof, man. I mean, it's, it's just abs. And the good part is that hedge funds don't come to Chicago, huh. right? Because it's too difficult to market for people outside to figure out, mm. right? Because it's quirky. Each village is very different, mm -hmm. right? Des Plaines is not the same as Park Ridge, and Park Ridge is not the same as Morton Grove. So that gives us such an advantage. But to go back to Florida, I wanted to find a market where... I could find where I can template it and scale up. Mm. I didn't want to go to Tampa. I didn't want to go to, obviously, Naples is pricing won't work. Miami has its own challenges. So I wanted a market which was a sleepy market where we would be the biggest landlords in town. And I did exactly what we do here, which is I sent our construction guy to Florida, and he's like, what do you want me to do? I'm like, just take my car and just start driving. When you get to Florida, you know, you go 100 miles north of Tampa, Go check into a hotel. 
And I'm like, I'll send you addresses and just start driving east, west, east, west, east, west. Don't go to be the beach because I don't want to be close to the water, right? And because I want bread and butter properties, exactly like we buy here. People, average person, anywhere from 850 square feet to 1,400 square feet. Three bedroom, uh, one and a half to two baths. That's normal ranch in Florida. And then we started north of Tampa. We went through Tampa, skipped all the hottest areas, all the way down to Naples. In the middle, we found a pocket called uh, Charlotte County. Mm. Punta Gorda, Port Charlotte is based there. So it's just south of Sarasota, about is 45 it, minutes south. Uh, is it somewhere clear water you said? Yeah, just south of that. Yeah. You know Ben Mala? Mm-hmm. Hmm? Yeah, he's in Tampa. Oh uh, no, no. Uh, um, I think he's in Clearwater. Clear Clear, Clear, yeah, yeah, same area. Tampa, yeah. same. Funny Pete. guy, yeah. Yeah, funny on guy. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> on the YouTube, he's yeah. a he's a he's a character. He's a character. <laughs> but he his model is you know his his model is he buys uh, uh I think now he buys all sorts of stuff, right? Retails and everything. But he buys it, fixes up, and then yeah. sells it, Correct. and then turn thirty one, ten thirty one, all that. Mm -hmm. That's his his yeah, style. That's his model. Uh, Chicago is good market for it's Airbnb. Great market, and Chicago is a great market. Better for than Airbnb. Florida. I don't know. It's better. I think it's different. Yeah. Right. Uh, F Chicago market is more steady. Uh, Florida market can be a little bit up and down in terms of, especially if you're kind of on the beach and that sort of thing. Right. Chicago market is very steady, but Florida is growing at a pace which is just unparalleled. Right. It's just absolutely unparalleled. And that was the reason why I wanted to pick something a little bit sleepier in Florida compared to where most people go because I could scale up, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I'll give you an example of that. We're, we were buying, when we got there, we went and messed up the market, um, but we were buying duplex lots ready to go, ready to build for 25,000 a piece for a duplex, mind you, putting up the whole duplex for 360, right? Both sides, so it's a three, two on each side, mm -hmm. uh, one car garage on each side, 1,200 square feet on each side. And it rents for $2,200 a month on each side. So that's $4,400 mm -hmm. a month, mm -hmm. right? And all in cost 360. Appraisal's mm -hmm. coming back at 510. Mm. So I buy the property, get the property built, refinance the money out every single month with today's interest rates at eight, close to 8%. You still cash flow $1,400 a month net on a regular rental, right? On Airbnbs, each side, we're making 38 to $3,900 net. I'm mean, sorry, gross a month, right? You take your debt service out of it. So on a duplex, 3,800, 3,800, mm -hmm. right? So you're 7,000 some change. Your payment on that is $2,400 a month. It's, it's, it's mind blowing. You can't, you, can't, you can't do that with multifamily. You may be able to, I don't know. Yeah. I, see, I've always believed How about this, you build that, like a, you build a multifamily for Airbnb? I, I guarantee you will get there. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to do what, see, here's what I realized, man, to make, 5,000 a month, I didn't need to go big. Mm. To make 10, I didn't need to go big. To get to 50, I could still do it with stuff I understand. Same thing. Right? Same thing with to get to 100, to get to 250. And my challenge with multifamilies, there's a lot of wealthy people that own multifamily properties, mm -hmm. but they've owned it generationally. People who truly have money. And I'm talking about uh, net worth, high net worth individuals that have a net worth of 50 million, to 30 million and up. That puts you in the high net worth category. Right? So... But how many people do you know that make 100,000 net a month? It's not too many, hmm. right? How many, 150, how many, 200? There's a lot of multifamily players that are, they do a flip strategy, which is they're in the business of capital raising, in the business of taking fees. So in the fee business, right? They'll do a syndication, raise money, take a piece. And I don't want to do that. I was going to, that was my next question. What yeah. do you think about the syndication? Everybody's doing this as man, syndications. Listen, just because everybody's doing it, I don't want to do it. Right. I don't want to do anything that everybody's doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I just have never been a proponent. Mm -hmm. I have yet to meet, and there's a lot of great syndicators, mind you. I have yet to meet somebody that says, hey, man, I have a $500 million portfolio. Mm -hmm. And it, mind you, it's not I have it. It's we have it, meaning we, they have we. a bunch of group of people. I have a They share. raise capital, right? Uh, and then they go out and raise capital for investors. Mm -hmm. uh, then they go out and get bank loans. The question is this. If you have a $500 million portfolio, what is your net a month? Nobody will share that. Mm. Give me a net number yeah, a month. Right. Right? You have a two billion dollar portfolio. I mean, I don't I don't even know how to count. Yeah, that I keep high. hearing these big numbers. Yeah. I have seven thousand units. Yeah. And then what's the what's the real yeah. yeah. What's they don't the go net into net? that. They See, don't know. it's like you know, like you run a brokerage company. Yeah. Right? Is it better to have two hundred agents and be net in a loss, mm -hmm. which you know a lot of real estate companies are? Sure. Or is it good to have good producers? 
may not be the highest producers, but they're good quality people that you can stay with and uh, you have 50 agents and you're profitable as a business, mm -hmm. right? And some people will say, no, I want to run a mega office mm -hmm. even if I'm not making much money. Other people will say, no, I want to be a highly profitable business. My belief is with what I do is I can be very profitable. I don't ever have to worry about a downturn because my margins are so big, right? Anytime there's, I mean, I'm hoping the interest rates stay high, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I... I'm probably the only person in real estate that says, hey, I like 8% interest rates, right? Because why? why? Man, because it kills everybody else. <laughs> I mean, it's simple. I can buy properties. See, I wasn't able to buy properties last year on the MLS. Yeah. Now, I mean, it's like eeny, meeny, miny, mo. It's great, <laughs> right? Because the other flippers are not competing with me. I like whenever the but market right is right now, right now, lately, we've noticing as well since January, yeah. a multiple offers. I again, know, again. But that's why, that's why I was happy they did the rate raise. I was yes, like, this is they great. they raised again. Yeah. See, what happened... I think it's going to slow down soon. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think what happened was when the market suddenly rates went up, mm -hmm. a lot of the flippers that were on the margins, they went out. Mm -hmm. They got scared. Mm -hmm. Now the market is stabilized. Mm -hmm. We saw this even with sales, right? Mm -hmm. Suddenly sales stop. And now we're seeing... They're coming back because people are like, okay, well, yeah, this is what it is, and the interest rates are not going down. So it's it's you know it's but no, I mean I I want it to be tough for the market because and whenever things are tough, I can make a lot of money. So let me ask you this again: uh, uh, and uh, when you buy a buy and hold, uh, yeah. you're uh, focused on a cash flow as a number one priority. No equity, equity, equity number one, cash flow number two. What if you're buying for as much as it's worth mm -hmm. and it's fixed up and then there is a cash flow? I won't buy it. You won't buy it. No. And, and I'll tell you the reason why. There's nothing wrong with that strategy, mm -hmm. but the, here's the reason. I'll give you an example in terms of Airbnb, right? So I have a, somebody um, that manages these Airbnbs for me. She's like, Andrew, if I had your, that kind of money, you know, I would buy expensive Airbnbs. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, listen, she's like, a friend of hers bought a property for 350 in the Smokies. Now she's selling for seven fifty. She's like, oh my God, she's making 200000 bucks. I'm like, listen, at one time in my life, I would have been ecstatic. Are you kidding me? I would have jumped up and down. I'm like, today, $200,000 is an extra income to me, mm -hmm. right? And it's, I'm going to have to pay taxes on it, or I have to defer that, do mm -hmm. a 1031 exchange, and buy more. My point is that if you really need the money, just do a little bit higher refi out, mm -hmm. Right? And right. keep the money and not pay taxes on it and go buy more. Sure. Um, there is no way. I mean, I have properties where I have maybe ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars loans left. Mm -hmm. I have two hundred thousand equity in them. Mm -hmm. Right? And I don't sell them. Mm -hmm. Could I sell them? Sure. Mm -hmm. But then what am I gonna do? Deploy the money back into more real estate. Mm -hmm. So why would I sell them? And here's the problem what happens is I'm like, okay, if I gave you two hundred thousand, you could go buy a million dollar house. Great. The question becomes is this. I, yeah, okay, I could come up with two, three, four million liquid, but it's going to limit the amount of properties I can buy, right? Because every time I have to put 20%, 20%, 20% down, then I have to furnish it, or even if I buy it furnished, it's going to limit my growth. That's the reason I don't buy properties without equity, because for the average human being, how much money are most people are going to have? Even people who are savers, 100,000 to 500,000. Mm -hmm. And they're going to get limited with the amount of properties they buy. That's why the average investor has one to four properties. One to two properties is your average investor in the United States. Because they're not buying with equity, they can't get the money out. The question is this, that if you don't have money, how do you start? You have to buy properties with equity because if you're get, getting a private money loan or a loan on the front end, how do you refi out? Then you get all your money back. That, 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 that <coughs> equity helps you get all the money back. Mm -hmm. That's what that that's that cushion that the banks are looking for, hundred percent. So, what do you think about this? Like you said, the the number one source of your leads were MLS and mm -hmm. agents. Mm -hmm. How about auctions? You like them? I love them. You I love. love you still do them. I still do them. Can you explain me something? Mm -hmm. So, auction dot com uh, platform, right? Uh, a lot of times you can't get into the property, right? Uh, there's a uh, foreclosures and there's bank owned. Mm -hmm. So, does that mean uh, that bank owned properties, all liens are paid off? Or so no. actually, let's back up. That's a great question because uh -huh. that creates a lot of confusion. So auction.com particularly has three types of properties on there, not two. It's three. Short sales. So short sales, a third, mm -hmm. right? So basically what happens is, just to keep it very brief, that a property goes into... So a lot of times people say, well, it's a foreclosure property. 
the biggest thing you have to know is what is a foreclosure property, meaning right. the person has fallen behind. Yes. So when they fell, fall behind, about 90 days, 120 days into it, the bank will file a court case. Mm -hmm. That's called a uh, list pendants or a foreclosure against the property. They're taking the property through the legal process, right? So that we call a short sale until the day of the auction. Now at that time, they could list it with you. As mm -hmm. an agent, you could sell the property for them. Uh, you could do a short sale for them. You could, another investor can buy it directly for them. So right now in Chicago, there are about 12,000 of those, right? Of those, there are about, about 1,000 that are listed in the MLS at any given time, mm -hmm. right? That's it. So most of them are not in the MLS even, and nobody's targeting them, mm -hmm. which is a big, big opportunity. So on, on auction.com, there are properties that are called bank-owned properties. So they go to a public auction. Right. So in Chicago, uh, downtown in Cook County, you have an auction that happens at uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, then there's another one, 10.30, sorry. There's one at 10.30, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, and 2 o'clock, just for Cook County. Mm -hmm. And then every other county has auctions. Mm -hmm. But Cook County happens every single day, right? Every single day. So at the auction, what will happen is two things will happen. Mm -hmm. Someone like you or I will go and bid on the property. Mm -hmm. So we buy a lot of properties there. Now, these are properties that are sight unseen yeah. because most of them we have not been able to get into, right? And we're buying them just by looking at the outside of the property and the area. Do you do, you do any research on uh, what's uh, other outstanding liens? Other so the only outstanding liens research we do is a couple of things. Number one is um, if it's a first lien. Because whenever they're selling the properties at auction, they're not telling you if they're selling lien number one or lien number two. That's right. Or if they're selling the condo or if they're selling the parking lot. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'll give you a perfect example. There's a big building downtown where um, we had somebody come to a three-day. They're like, oh, my God, this is the secret. I got Andrew's secret <laughs> is how to buy. And, and sometimes people will take part of the information and go execute, and that can be very dangerous. Right? That's right. Content is good. Mm -hmm. Like today we're talking content. Mm -hmm. But this has to be put in context. Mm -hmm. What context are you talking about? Right? That's like the depth we were talking about. And so this lady goes, and at the auction, the condo as well as the, park, uh, as well as the parking space mm -hmm. is coming up. They read the CH number. So CH number will go something like 19CH, blah, 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 right? whatever the number. And 19 is when the foreclosure was filed. So 20 is going to be a foreclosure was filed in 2020, mm. right? Some, that's how that goes. Mm -hmm. In Chicago, the foreclosures take anywhere from a year and a half to five years mm. to get to court mm -hmm. and to be auctioned off. Nowhere else in the country it takes this long. Yeah. So we have a large window of opportunity to get them before they get there, mm -hmm. right? And so she bids on the property when it comes up because they just call out the CH number and property address, and it doesn't say whether it's the, um, whether it's the parking space or whether it's condo. She gets up and leaves. Five minutes later, they call the, and none of the bidders that are there, that are the seasoned bidders, everybody's like quiet. And she's, and she calls me 60 days later. And she's like, oh, I bought that property. Can't wait to get my confirmation. And I'm like, listen, if I was you, you know, and uh, I would pay attention before the confirmation. We checked her confirmation already happened. So the judge had already signed the order. There's no way for her to undo it. She lost $162,000. For the parking lot? For the parking space. Right? Why? Because she just listens to half the information. So right. the research that we do is, number one, is the property that we're saying coming up? Or is it just the garage parcel? Right? So that's the number one thing. Number two, is it lien number two or lien number one? Uh, we bought a property in Streamwood, $28,000. Right? And I bought lien number one. Lien number two had already sold for $119,000. The person had bought it, had rehabbed the property, pulled city permits, the property was 99% done. We bought out lien number one, wiped out that position completely. Nothing they can do. There's nothing you can take a, take it to court. You can do whatever you want. But you don't own lien number one, right? And Why now, didn't they buy lien number one? Because they didn't extra. know. Uh -huh. They didn't know how to do the research. So a lot of times when well, you think about... How do you do the research? Uh, court records and fidelity, mm. right? I mean, we do... We have a relationship with fidelity... And there, and the problem is in Chicago, the way these things are recorded, it's very odd, right? And so it's you and I should not be doing that mm -hmm. at all, whatsoever. Period. Mm -hmm. 
right? This should be done by somebody who really understands how to read uh, the title. And it can be extremely complicated. And the biggest uh, biggest thing is a lot of times people will like, well, how could you buy a property that is occupied? You've never been in the property. I'm like, property I can fix. The lien, meaning lien number one or lien number two, that I can't fix, right? right? Uh, I mean, and we've bought hundreds of properties like that, right? So it's not about, now the one thing that you have to be careful, Hillside, there was a property, um, <laughs> somebody looked at Google map. Mm. They look at the property, property's existing. They buy the property based on the Google map because Google map sa says so, right? Now, Mark Zuckerberg did not come out yesterday and take a picture of the property, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, right. And it was it's gone. 2019. Why? The village Maybe. had demolished the house. Yeah. Now, that's rare. It doesn't happen that much. But in the city, the, uh, the properties that go to uh, salvage, they have the X on it, right? You got to make sure if you're going to buy something, you got, and that's where it's that buying at the auction at that level is very dangerous. Yeah. It's very, very, and that's not for the faint-hearted at all. Because you may buy the property, um, you, the property, what happens if it burns down? See, all you get is a sales receipt at the auction. You do not get a deed at the auction. Mm -hmm. You get a sales receipt 45 days to 60 days to 90 days. Mm -hmm. Later, you get an actual deed. Mm -hmm. Then, what if you have to do an eviction? Right. right? If in Chicago, and this is for Chicago only, if somebody is living in the property and they have a valid bona fide lease. What does valid bona fide lease mean? Is it needs to be within 5% of current market rents. Mm -hmm. It can't be a made up lease. Mm -hmm. And you have to verify if they have a lease and you want to vacate that property, you have to pay $10,640 to each tenant huh. to get them out, <laughs> right? And there's a lot of, now I'm not trying to scare people. What I'm saying is that there's a lot of nuances yeah. and the devil is in the details. So. If you're buying on auction.com, if you buy a property that is a bank-owned property, you don't have to worry about any of those things. It comes bank with owned. bank owned. If it says right. REO bank owned property, you're totally good. Yes. Don't even worry about it. Yeah. Right? You can bid on the auction, you can buy the property. Only thing you have to worry about is that is the property vacant or not? Right. You need to verify that. And um, at that point, what is the condition? That's it. So it's very safe to buy on auction.com as long as you're buying bank owned properties, mm -hmm. 100%, no problem. They come with title insurance, you don't even have to worry about title. Okay. But the biggest scary thing when you're buying at auctions, live auctions, where the sheriff is bidding off the property, mm -hmm. that's not the condition of property, it's the title of the property. Uh, how did the billboards work out for you a couple years ago? It's a big disaster. <laughs> Didn't work big out? It fed my ego, I was competing with hair club for men or whatever that <laughs> yeah. place is. <laughs> yeah, but, you got I mean, a bunch of them, right? Man, I spent $180,000, and every, all, everybody that knows me, they're like, dude, we see you on the highway. I got a bunch of pictures. Mm -hmm. And I, my parents were in town, and they're like, our son is famous. Yeah. You know, uh, but uh, besides that, zero. So you were doing that to, for, um, for your uh, uh, RIA, right? For the for association. Real Estate Investment for, Association. So yeah. talk about that. What is that? So, like, what's so your goal with, uh, with uh, RIA? The RIA, man, the goal, it was like literally, I used to be at Remax Central, right, in Roselle. Um, and I always thought I had something to say, yeah. right? I mean, maybe <laughs> I wasn't sure anybody would listen or not, right? But uh, back in 2012, I went to AM560 at the time, um, WIND, and I got a radio yeah. show, yeah. right? And uh, that, and I was talking about real estate because I heard so many real estate gurus, and it was BS. Uh -huh. It was complete BS because they talked about money, making money in thin air, without any depth. Mm. And I'm like, if these guys can just make up stuff, I'm gonna be honest about it, right? I mean, I don't know anything that I've done in my life where I haven't worked my tail off to succeed. I don't, I mean, I'm not the guy who'll ever say quit your job and go, go do this, you're gonna make millions. This is not how li real life works, right? You can make millions, but <laughs> trust me, life is gonna exact a price out of you yeah. in every business, sure. right? That's the case. You do, I mean, today people do YouTube. Right? And they look at successful YouTubers. Oh my God, I'm gonna travel the world, right? And eat food and just comment. Yeah. It's not that easy. Yeah. Right? This is a commitment. This yeah. is a job. This is something you have to do. And so that kind of really where I started. I used to do free just events at the office Tuesday nights uh, from the radio show. Some people would show up. Sometimes it was two people in the room, sometimes it was one. Um, and sometimes, and gradually over time, it was 20, then 40, and 60. 
where I was just giving out information what could be done with real estate. What I didn't realize was, and a lot of people were like, why would you give this information? I'm like, man, because I'm excited about it, right? I, I think this is a lottery ticket. I mean, that's really what, I, I didn't charge for anything, it was zero. Yeah, it was yeah, like revenue to your right? like. I probably went to your like ten of your events. Yeah, your seminars, and I went to the three day too. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. They all free, but uh, yeah, you like you you're working hard. You're yeah, doing no, 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 man. In the I, evening, like for I, ten I years love, or something already. I, I love talking about this, right? I mean, like yeah. this is some people say what we're doing today is work. We're talking about what I like to talk about, but I mean, literally, it started there, and then you know what I always felt was I felt very lonely as a real estate agent. I felt very lonely. As a real estate investor, I felt very lonely because who do you go share the excitement with that I just bought a property, man, that I think is worth <laughs> 300 and I just paid 100000 for it? With Most a fellow agent. Most people don't even understand. Who you share with a fellow agent? Nobody in my office. <laughs> everybody in my office used to think I was crazy. <laughs> right? I mean, everybody thought I was nuts because I'd stand up, two headsets, calling every day, and I'd take my commission checks and I used to have them pinned in the office. I wouldn't cash the checks. And oh. people didn't know. People are like, oh, he's just showing off. Listen, man, I've been broke. Mm. Like, I've been really, really broke. Those checks that were uncashed were my security blanket. Mm -hmm. Every day I'd look at them, and I'm like, oh, my God, I got four checks now that I haven't cashed yet, right? This one is six months old, right? And literally my year, my goal was that I'm not going to cash the checks for a year, right? So that I would have, and, and a lot of people have different issues. My di issue was I, maybe, uh, you know, self-esteem was my issue. Right. And so uh, when I had a little bit of money, I felt better about myself. You know, maybe this was just me. Sure. But uh, and I realized a lot of people have that issue. They just don't admit it. Yeah. Right. Uh, and um, all the agents thought I was like nuts. Right. They're like, what are you doing buying all these properties, Andrew? You know, everybody is going bankrupt. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, listen, maybe maybe I can pay off one. Maybe I can pay off two. At least I'll have two paid off properties, which I I mean. Man, I was making 300000 as an agent, making pretty decent living. This is 2007, and I had nothing. If I was sick a week, the, I, it would show up on my closed sales 90 days later. Sure. I mean, you know, it's a 69-day yeah. cycle in real yeah. estate with what we do. And, and I just did not like it because I was always scared. And the worst time of the year was fall to December, which was I knew January 1st was coming. Yeah. Right. And then the whole process. And I tried all over. every seminar in the book I went to and I was tired of being motivated. Right. I was like, man, this sucks. But there this was no social media back then, too. There was no there was no social media back then. And I was like, this. Who do you connect with? My biggest yeah. problem was that everybody seemed to be doing good. I mean, 2005, six, you yeah. go to clients houses. They got brand new cars. Yeah. They got TV in every room. Here I'm working my buns off. And trying to save whatever little I'm making, right? And I'm like, man, I, I don't know how people live these lifestyles, right? I could never figure this out. And not realizing all those clients, I resold their properties at, as short sales. Mm -hmm. A bunch of their properties I bought, right? And I flipped them, mm -hmm. you know, later. But, I mean, I really was, like, I was scared. And I had been poor, and I didn't want to go, to go back to that again, right? And maybe I operated out of being scared, but... You know, I'd rather be a little scared rather than be too For sure. on the other side of it. But one thing that it did do was that once I had a few properties that I paid off, it gave me a sense of security. Right? It was like, okay, yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I, I know ten, fifteen, twenty thousand comes in without me even thinking about it, right? And then, I mean, when Corona happened, it was interesting for a lot of people. Were you scared? Right. No? Yeah, no, I mean, you yeah, know, you're I good. like you're good. I like to fly, so <laughs> you know, I know. I mean, that's the first time I got a chance to take the airplane, and I traveled all over the country yeah. because I had time. Yeah, right. And it was it was a good time. You have you have like um, right now your day to day. Can you like uh, go on vacation for a month and not even pick up a phone or something? Yeah, like, I mean, like 115 really? would come in, no problem, no yeah. problem. Yeah, a month that would come in net, so that's pretty good. But you know what happens is this is a drug, man, right? Which is right. that, I mean, now, and what has happened is the simple idea that I started with, like we just ended a three-day, day before yesterday, mm -hmm. right? Today, we have so many people that are netting out net a month, 40000 a month, yeah, right? 50000 a month. Now the next goal for everybody is 100000 
Yeah. So if everybody else's goal, there are people who are doing well, is a hundred thousand net a month, then mine's got to be at least two, two and a half, three times that, right? That's right. So, so, so for the listeners, your uh, RIA mm-hmm. association, that's uh, a coaching. Um, There's a six week class I do from class. that. Right. A lot of people that come there and they want to kind of build up their portfolio, There's they come to that class. That's a mastery class. That's a mastery class, yeah. yeah. Usually they reach, uh, find you about, uh, about you about for, from the seminars. Correct. They go to a three-day. Then if they want to really take it serious, they go right. to the mastery. Right. And you have a lot of connections to different like lenders, yeah. private lenders, deal sources. I mean, sources. basically the whole point is all the pieces we need in the business. Yeah. Right. See, this is not – like there's a lot of real estate gurus – Right, you come here. Here's we give you a course, yeah. and go ahead and leave. I and went thank through, you very much. I went through. Right, one the of problem them. is here's why it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. You're buying a property, and you're like, hey man, now what do I do? Who do you pick up the phone and call? Mm-hmm. The coach is sitting in Utah, or sitting in Florida. They don't know Des Plaines different from Rosemont, sure, and they don't know Rosemont different from Tinley Park, mm-hmm. right? Here, where our point is that hey, listen, for your first two three transactions, before you get the property under contract. Then you reach out to us. Mm-hmm. Our, you're going to run the numbers based on what we laid out for you, and then we're going to run the numbers, right? And we're going to, okay, make sense. Yes, no, don't make sense. But what is the logic? Why are we saying no? Why are we saying yes, right? It's help when you need it. And then the next thing comes up, okay, where do I find the money? And what I was very fortunate, and uh, I mean, Stino Melito, right, wh- where you work, was one of those people. Mm-hmm. Like, literally at one time, he used to lend me two, three, four hundred dollars $400,000, and I have hundreds of people like him that came, they got a great interest rate on the money they lent. Mm-hmm. And so we have a huge group of private money lenders that lend you even if it's your first deal. Purchase and rehab, full 100%, which is unheard of in the country. And these are all people that used to lend to me at one time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now as the group has grown, today we have a lot of doctors, a lot of people that are well-to-do individuals. They don't necessarily want to do real estate, but they don't mind doing lending. Because they're sitting home and two points, 12%, right? So 1% a month uh, in six months. So they turn the money two times a year, 16%. And it's backed with good quality deals. So that's, and then you need, well, who do I go to for refi? Refi. Who are the lender? Like all the pieces that you need in a transaction. Because I'm doing that every day. So we have that. Hence, the success is what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've been doing the YouTube for, for quite some time, yeah? Yeah, I mean, I actually... Recently started paying more attention to yeah. it. So I that's a whole a That's a people. whole new game, right? The you, game. You, YouTube thing is like it's, the it's, SEO, the titles, the tags, the thumbnails. It's a nightmare. I mean, but every the, day I'm frustrated with it. Yeah, I just started YouTube, yeah. you know, recently. Uh, I've had it for a long time, but I treat it like a dumpster. So I created content, I put it in there. So now we started paying more attention to it. Like all this thumbnail, all the titles and everything. This is like, in my opinion, the, 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 the platform number one. for Next this thing. Co- yeah. Next thing. Yeah. And if real estate agents aren't on it, they're making a huge mistake. Yeah. Right? If you don't control social media today, uh, somebody's going to eat your lunch. See, as a real estate agent, I uh, grew on Facebook. Right. Uh, I put out a content. I did even the restaurant reviews content. Sure. I went to the restaurant, did sure. a video with the restaurant owner, put it on. And it got spread through the Facebook. It's a lot, Facebook is like a local thing for a real estate agent. It's good. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you're trying to build uh, like a online credibility, the YouTube uh, platform, one hundred percent, because it's also searchable through yeah. Google owns the YouTube. Yeah. yeah, so it's interesting, right? You never thought you're going to be a YouTuber. No, I, I <laughs> never thought. You know, it's it's interesting where I made a mistake. I have some. I don't know if they're still live or not. YouTube videos that I made back in 2014, right, 2011. I yeah. should have continued those. Yeah, it literally at some of these flips. It's cold as heck, and I have a sure. little camera at the time, obviously, because we didn't have the yeah. cell phones we have today. Man, I missed that boat. Yeah. Right? I missed that boat big time. Yeah. Right? And, and now we're trying to play catch up. Yeah. Right? Even with podcasts, right? You talk about podcasts, you talk about, I mean, any and all forms of content and social media. And the interesting thing is, the, I mean, like, look at if somebody looks at behind the scenes setup, uh, what you have, right? You, you're putting actual effort this is not the end product to have a good end product today you're gonna have to get good and the yeah. fun the fun part is you can literally do some great videos with a little iphone you don't need sure. anything to start fancy to start yeah you could literally do that and you don't need uh, one thing on youtube i don't know if you've noticed this or even on facebook right you don't need a lot of audience to make a lot of money yeah right 
that you can literally have a small following, yet if there are people who actually buy from it, whatever product you have, you may be an agent, you may be a selling a service, whatever your end product is, you can have a very small list. Even with the email list, it's the same thing. Yeah. Right? But the question is, are they bu- the buyers that you want and that consume the content? But today, you have to give more information away than what can I get out of it. And as long as you're great at giving out good information about whatever you do, there's an audience out there. Yeah, my YouTube go- goal yeah. is to build a brokerage. To build a brokerage, okay. That's that's what I'm doing this for. Got it. Okay, like, I'm right. doing the content for agents. Agents right. have a lot of interests. Sure. They want to invest. They want to grow their sales. Right. They want to grow their... Uh, like skills, communication skills, all that stuff. So I'm trying to, to develop this as a, a channel for for building the brokerage. You know, you know I, it was interesting. I was in uh, I was at a company just recently. It's called Carrot.com. It's a landing uh-huh, yeah. page. Yeah, right? yeah, I, I've um, heard about it. They yeah, build websites for yeah, for, they, for yeah. agents for uh-huh. whatever. Yeah, so yeah, the guy who runs it, great guy, Trevor. Uh-huh. Maybe you should have him on on a business podcast. And actually, it'll be great for agents. Right, so super nice guy. If you need to connect, let me know. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, but I was at his office oh. uh, recently, Oregon, and there's a and this is like Roseburg, Oregon. Like this is a town of twenty thousand people in the middle of nowhere, like literally in the middle of nowhere, right? And there's an agent there I met that was at this meeting, and real estate agent, and his whole he dominates the town. He makes these videos about why should you be in Oregon? Why you know five cons of being in Oregon, like that kind of thing. They're not good quality content. And I, I'm shocked that how few agents, like if you want to be a great agent in Barrington, put up all the stuff that is of interest to people, genuine good information, you will dominate them. It'll take some time. But you're, because there's so many good agents that know so much about yes. the areas they live in. Yeah, they're right? scared of the camera. Yeah, they are. They are. Yeah, that's right. the thing. And that's everybody sounds bad. Yeah, everybody looks horrible. Yeah, that's what we, that's what we all think. That's normal. That's normal. That's, that's I, I can't watch my videos no. uh, myself. I when I watch my videos, I feel like ah man, I you're suck. not you're not so good. But uh, but I put it out there, people like it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so that yeah. works. No, you that's know? that's all it is. But yeah. I mean, I think for agents especially, and you don't have to be. Uh, Chicago is too big a market. It's like a country, right? You could literally take one town that you live in. I mean, a condo building, you could dominate. Yeah. Right? I was telling this to, I live in a condo building in Oak Brook, right? And I was telling the, the, one of the agents that lives there, she's like, Andrew, it'll work. I'm like, listen, think about how many people from just this condo building come to the events that I do. Yeah. And I never, I'm not marketing to them. Yeah. Right? Uh, they're, they just happen to know I live in the condo building. Yeah. Right? But uh, I'm like, if I was you, rather than just putting those flyers, which everybody throws away, I would just give the latest information, what's going on, the condo association is a mess, what is the good things, what is the bad things, what the latest condo sold for. You think everybody, all the old people that live there want to know? 100%. Sure. You know, you show pictures of it. Like, nothing very fancy. This is stuff that's, half the stuff is on MLS. Yeah. And even, it doesn't even have to be your listing, right? Just say, hey, there was a sale, right? You don't have to claim the listing, but... If you're That's the right. person who knows more than anybody else, guess who they're going to call? If it's Susan, they're going to call Susan. That's simple. Yeah, for sure. Um, you planning to buy a mansion or something? No, man. I, You know, <laughs> it's just funny you say that. Um, I looked at a property just recently, Oak Brook. It was on the market, 8.2 million. For yourself? Now you, 8.2? Yeah. Now it came down. It's for been s- on the market six? six years. Wait, is that uh, right now listed at six? No, it's listed at 1.5. It's listed at 1.5. Um... In ground pool, in indoor in ground pool, right? Yeah, it needs different. about a million, million two into it, right? Neighborhood, all the houses about three to four million, five million, somewhere over there, right? The problem is, man, when I could afford a big house, when I couldn't afford a big house, I wanted one. Now I can afford it, and I live in a small condo, right? I bought the office building right down the street. We just bought a big fifteen thousand square foot building. Um, but you live in a condo. I live in a condo. You, you you plan to buy a house? No. no, no, no. Just looked? No, man. I mean, <laughs> you know, I get tempted. The problem is yeah. it's another headache to take on, right? I'm not, you know, it's like, so a lot of people measure their wealth in the size of the house they live in. Yeah. I measure my wealth in the number of houses I own, other people live in. And my perspective has changed. Mm-hmm. The, a lot of the things that I used to think I want now, when I can afford them, 
I know. You know, I, it's the, I'm it's not just, that fascinated. All the fancy you know, restaurants, like, I used to be like, man, one day I'm going to yeah. be able to. Now I'm like happy with the much oh, you've more got the Bentley? Thing. No, I got the Bentley. Yeah. I have the Rolls. I have yeah. the airplane. I mean, I have, <laughs> I'm not saying I don't. But the problem is when beyond the Bentley and the Rolls Royce, what do you buy? Right? I don't want a Ferrari. I mean, I, I like a Ferrari, but it's just the Too ride smoke. sucks. You know? The ride sucks. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> I mean, and I got it from the, the Bentley guys. They're like, hey, man, take this. They give me a um, uh, California, then the, the new one that came out. And they're like, hey, just drive it, dude, for a week. Like, that's how they sold the rolls to me. Mm. Right? And they're like, hey, just take you it like for the a ride? week. You like the ride? The rolls is nice. Bro. The rolls, yeah. The problem I is heard, I you're heard borrowing a, it. It's like driving a couch. Yes. Right? That's I mean, it it's not like it doesn't corner, right? <laughs> and you're driving a, like a four, you know, almost a $4,000 car around. Now it's more stress than <laughs> the joy of riding it. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, it's, it's just, you're like, oh, my God. I'm gonna, yeah, you're stressed. You know, but you're the, probably parking somewhere in the corner I far don't, away. I don't. I mean, somebody no. scratched my rim. I was like, okay. <laughs> I mean, it is what it is, right? I Otherwise. think the, the, the goal is like a lot of listeners probably like, I wish I, I could get that G-Wagon. Yeah. That's my goal. Yeah. It's just that that opportunity that I can I can buy it the 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 the, the, the ability the ability to buy when you have the money it's it's like I can I can buy it, but that's not what drives me anymore. No, I, mean I want now, you know you know what it is. I think for men especially, I don't know about women. Maybe yeah. it's about more about shoes and whatever. For men, we have very fragile egos. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and we want to prove something. Want to yeah. conquer. This is a very normal thing. Who doesn't yeah. want to have nice stuff, man? I mean, we all like nice shit. Right? But I think at some point you start growing up mm. and you're like, okay, I'm good. I mean, if I want something, to f I'm fortunate, now I can afford it. But it can't, the funniest thing happened, uh, me and a couple of the people from the Ria, we landed in, um, what was it? Somewhere in Naples or something, right? This yeah. beautiful Naples airport, all these big jets. We land over there and the lady had this, and I had gotten a deal on a car, right? $22 for the day on mm. the car. And she looks at me, she's like, sir, are you sure you want this car? I'm like, yeah, right? Uh, it's this fancy FBO. It's called fixed base operations where you, like, where you hang out of the airplane. Mm -hmm. and, and Rahul is making fun of me. He's like, are you sure, right, you want to rent this car? I'm like, man, I'm perfectly fine, right? And I'm like, some sort of a Hyundai something, right? Mm -hmm. I'm like, listen, dude, at one time, my ego was so fragile that I would rent a more expensive car of what other people think about me. Today, I'm excited to drive a car that's $22 because today I realize it doesn't make me. Yeah. Right? I mean, and I feel better about myself because I don't have to prove something. Because I was all my life I ran behind trying to prove something to somebody. Who knows who? Yeah. Right? Isn't that God knows who. Yeah. I was trying to prove something too. But I think it was just purely based on that my own thing, my own self-esteem was lower. And I think a lot of people struggle with that. A lot of people struggle with yeah, that. They buy, and then they buy stuff with they money buy they stuff don't that have. They cannot afford with money they, they don't, don't have. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think, and that ends badly. Yeah. And one fortunate thing was that I've always been so scared, right, that I have always stayed away from that, right? I've never, like, even all the stuff, the airplanes, all the stuff, I do not spend a dime of the cash flow. I mean, since 2011 till today, I have never So what are you spent, buying with? I buy more houses. No, no, like, well, for example, you buy... Other earned uh, income. Earned? Earned income. So all the other stuff I do, if it's flips, if it's, uh, if it's the events, if it's everything else, that money I will splurge. But you use the cash flow to buy something cash else. Cash flow to buy more houses. More houses. One discipline I've always had, and that's what I try to brainwash everybody with, do not quit your job. Do not quit your job. If you're a real estate agent, yes. do not quit being a real estate agent. It's one of the best professions. Yeah. You can make money anytime. You have to put in a little bit of work. Takes but time. Don't quit it. Takes right? time. And that's important uh, because then you can keep multiplying and you can keep growing. A lot of times people quit too soon and that gets them into trouble. Grant Cardone says that you gotta, uh, you gotta use your cash flow to buy stuff. Yeah, absolutely. No, no, to, 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 to spend to money. Like, yeah, he's see, 180 from you. Yeah, so I don't, I don't believe that you should use that cash flow. I believe you should keep using, you should keep doing your day job, mm -hmm. right, for most people. Like, for you, you run a brokerage, right? You've spent a lot of time getting good at it. Do you have any tips for me, maybe? Man, I think there's a lot of people that are, with what all the things that you're doing, 
I think some of these things, skill sets, if you teach agents, they're desperate need. Social media, yeah. they're desperate need. Yeah. Right. And I think you should do a few events for agents, a lot of the new agents, because I hate to say this, a lot of the newer agents are going to eat the lunch for all the older agents that are in the business today. Because sure. a lot of these younger agents, they're so good mm -hmm. with technology, with social media, with all this stuff. I mean, they can wipe out somebody who's been in the business, or at least they can catch up at, at an unprecedented speed. Yes. Right? And I think this is desperately needed in our industry. Is Older agents, agents are resting on their success. No. They think that... They've worked hard. They've worked hard, man. They've worked hard all their lives. Yes. Right? And so it's like, how long do you keep doing this? That's right. right? It's tough you have a huge, because you're way ahead in terms of what you know about social media. And I think it's desperately needed in our industry. You planning to retire in Illinois? Uh, I when don't know, man, comes? about retire. No, I mean, now it's the new horizons of Florida, right? So we're building, I mean, there's so many properties that are going up now in Florida that I want to have a choice, Yeah. right? It's like I changed my residency to Florida, Um and uh, because the seminar business and all that stuff is run out of Florida now, mm -hmm. right? All the stuff we're doing over there. Yeah, so I was going to ask you about, um, it's a Chicago Real Estate Investment Association, Chicago, yeah, Chicago Real Estate. Now it's a national RE Invest. Yeah. So those so, are two different? Yeah, so those are two kind of, kind of bifurcations of the same business, right? It started in Chicago. So there's another business called Chicago Funding, uh -huh. right? We made that national RE funding also. Mm -hmm. Because as the business has grown, what we realized was, we have a lot of people that are attending that are from Indiana, that are attending that are from Atlanta, that are attending that, and they use the same template. Mm -hmm. The basic format is the same, right? So then we kind of went a little bit broad with it as we open up now Airbnbs. Um, this is something, actually yesterday I was in Michigan City, it was in New Buffalo, uh, to- Yes, uh, I know the city. Uh, yeah, so uh, mm -hmm. to build A-frames, right? We're trying to- build what? Uh, A-frame, those, uh, those cute little A-frame properties. Right, with the modern looking. Uh, oh, to, um, yeah. To so the scale up with that, like buy a three acre piece of, par piece of parcel. And that's put expensive seven of those. parcels over there. I'm sorry? That's expensive parcels over there. It's actually not that expensive. It's not on the lake. No, no, no. no, you no don't okay, wanna, okay. I don't want to be on the lake. I right. want to be in the woods, yeah, in yeah, the middle yeah. of nowhere. Okay, okay. Right? So that it's within 90 miles driving distance to Chicago. Huh. Right? So, I mean, there's different ideas that I'm thinking about, but the question becomes it's like you, right? Um, do I keep doing the same boring stuff that I do over mm -hmm. and over mm -hmm. and keep scaling? Mm -hmm. Because every time you go open up a new business, a new can of worms, right? we were laughing about this, but the cigar store, mm -hmm. right? there's an epic failure for me. Um, and uh, you sometimes, if, you're, if you have a hobby, keep it a hobby. Don't turn, try to turn it into a business because it may not work out. And just because you're good at one thing doesn't mean you're good at everything. Right? I learned that lesson from that whole cigar store yeah. adventure. Yeah. So, I mean, probably I'm going to lose about 250000 bucks in that whole adventure, but it is what it is. Mm -hmm. so. so, how many people working for you? Uh, now we have uh, one person in Florida, and we have an office staff, about six people. In Florida? Here? No, here. Oh, over here. Yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I mean, we're growing. I mean, we're, in fact, social media, we're looking to hire more people. We're looking to hire more people for Airbnbs. We're looking. I mean, we're looking. So Who manages your portfolio here? Uh, like I the regular rentals? I have uh, one lady she manages it. She made the whole thing? The whole thing. See, I don't wow. do any one-year rentals. I do only two to three-year rent rentals. Yeah. So our turnover is about 4.8 to 5.2 years average mm. tenant. So we don't get renewals. And about 75, 80% of our people renew because we don't raise the rents. Mm -hmm. So even lately, you haven't raised not a bit? Very, very slight. Slight. Very slight. Yes. Right? Compared to most people, we're pretty, we hold them pretty tight. What was the most expensive uh, property you bought? Except for the office, you probably paid. Yeah, money. office, yeah, that's the, that's a Like the rental. Thing. Like uh, like you buying a 20 unit right now in Hyde Park? Yeah, but that's not that much, man. That's 900,000, right? I mean, th that's probably the most expensive. Probably, yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, most of, like even Schomburg, I just bought a property, 2,600 square foot property. I paid 270 for it, right? Appraisal came back 510. I put... 60 and well, well, where was that it. property from? Where did you Tipton. find it? So uh, don't tell me it's a, on MLS. No, that was mailing. Was mailing. What kind of list? Uh, that was a absentee owner list. Absentee. How many c c properties you have on the contract on any given time? I am buying more this year. Like right now, I have uh, 11 properties under contract that I'm buying. Um, so 
because I mean, and that's the cha challenge with that is that each time you start buying, uh, now how many can you get rehabbed, man? Buying mm -hmm. is the easy part. Getting them all rehabbed and online, that's tough. You probably that's got to tough. the point where you have like a big line of credit and you just buying it. It's I have cash. a big line. Of, cash is not the issue anymore. Yeah. Right. Cash is the easy part now. <laughs> but uh, that the sounds part, really good. No, no, no. <laughs> because I mean, like, man, listen. I mean, now at this point, now mind you, I've been I've been at it since two thousand eight. Right. I don't <laughs> want to give anybody any false impressions. This takes time to build. Yeah. But today, right, we have people that that are never real estate investors, and we can get them up to $3 million line mm -hmm. uh, in a matter of a year and a half, two years. Mm -hmm. That's not difficult to do, right? To have a 10 or $15 million line in today's market is, is easy, right? The money is not the issue in today's market. The issue is not only can you find the deals, can you find the good deals in good areas? Mm -hmm. That's Anybody can find a deal in a bad area. Yeah. The key is can you find a good area, can you find a good deal, and you, can you get it rehabbed at a number that makes sense? And that's my biggest struggle right now. I just this morning got a call from Lake Zurich about a property in Lake Zurich, right? And uh, that's A plus. Uh, oh yeah. Neighborhood. Oh yeah. I mean, I mean, now I'm buying all A, oh. all A and all A plus, but I mean, with equity. With equity, yeah. With that's equity. that's like the uh, the, the job uh, becomes ten times harder. Yeah, correct. A plus with equity, that's like a dream come true. Yeah. No, I mean that's, <laughs> but that's where I mean I think there's a lot of good properties that come up. Right, um, but you have to kind of keep. A, there's a property in uh, uh, Des Plaines. Uh, I'm just picking up MLS property written uh, was listed with Ryan Smith at one time. Uh, I'm paying two hundred and thirty thousand. I've been after it for last six months. It goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down as an REO. Finally, they're like, "What will you pay?" I'm like, "I'll close ten days, fifty thousand earnest money. I buy it, right, and I'll put up a lot of earnest money today." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Used to be, I couldn't. Today, I mean, I'll offer twenty thousand, thirty thousand earnest money, fifty thousand, no problem. Mm -hmm. Why? Because people are like, "Is this guy real?" I'm like, "I'm going to cash this check, no problem." Yeah. But just give me the property, right? I mean, because to me, the property is I have to pay for it anyways, and I'm doing fifteen day closings, twenty day closings. So if your title is ready, I'll close. Right? I was just gonna buy a six flat in this plains. Yeah. It was in private. Yeah. I gave him even over ask. Yeah. You wouldn't probably buy what I was gonna buy. I'll tell you what I was gonna yeah. buy. You wouldn't even probably buy. I didn't get it. They they gave it to somebody else. So it was a six flat, uh, four two bedrooms, two one beds, uh, very good condition, all fixed up. Mm -hmm. Seven fifty they asked. I gave him seven sixty five. Okay, couldn't get it. Probably somebody gave him seven seventy five. So what did you think the real ARV is on that property? Uh, pr uh, uh, probably eight hundred. My my opinion is. Yeah. See, to me, that's where the issue would be: is the equity is lacking. To me. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna even. I was thinking even like maybe do a seven eighty and just yeah. get it and just yeah. sit on it for years and sure. just have it cash flow and maybe appreciate. Nothing wrong with that. I, mean, I think for a lot of people that's a great strategy, right? It's just not the strategy for me. See, I was I started uh, buying in twenty seventeen as a uh, as I got into real estate. Uh, started slowly with Stino's help. Yeah, got a couple condos mm -hmm. and then uh, I started buying more and more. Uh, and now I'm looking back, I've got like. Couple thousand, a uh, couple tens of thousands there, a couple tens of thousands there. I don't know. If, start, if I start selling them, there's going to be much less equity if I start selling. But I'm thinking maybe sell two and then buy something bigger with sure. that equity. Sure. Uh, what do you think? Is that a good idea or just to keep me, it? I would keep it, refinance it a little bit. I don't have need still it. enough equity in it to. No, I mean, I, some of the them, like some of them, I like. I bought a condo in Chicago Ridge. Mm -hmm. I got sixty. I bought it for sixty thousand. Now it's worth one ten. Right. My loan is forty. Right. So I got some room to equity. pull the equity yeah. out. Hmm. Uh, so my lease expires in a couple of weeks. So I'm thinking maybe I should sell it and put put the equity into something bigger, or I should just maybe just let it go, keep it re-rented, and just keep buying something else. Yeah, I mean, if you can basically, so I'll give you an example. Uh, I'm self-managing, by the right. way. Right. So like what we did was some of the properties in South Suburbs that we own, mm -hmm. we took the cash flow from that and paid down properties in Northwest. Mm. Right, because I consider in Chicago the Northwest suburbs. Obviously, I'd love to be able to buy every property in Park Ridge. Right, I can't. Mm -hmm. Right, and so the portfolio we have in the Northwest part of town, I consider that to be the best portfolio. Right, that eighty percent of my portfolio is in Northwest part of Chicago mm -hmm. suburbs. Mm -hmm. Right, but so we use the properties in the 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 South suburbs to take the cash flow 
and pay down these properties mm. because this is bulletproof, right? With Airbnbs, as I'm buying those because there are higher numbers. So my philosophy is a simple philosophy that when a, if you live on the shore, right, and you live in a 50-story building, if the foundation of the building is very good and you live on the 50th floor, 49 of them have to flood and you will buy every single one as they flood. Mm-hmm. 49 of them are, if they flood, then we have a nuclear holocaust anyways. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter, mm-hmm. right? So what it means is that whenever economy collapses, if you're at the top of the food chain, you're okay. Mm-hmm. Everybody in the bottom gets in trouble and the people at the top of the food chain start buying up everything at the bottom. Mm-hmm. And so with Airbnbs, the play that I look at it is that uh, I don't want my basis in it, meaning my basis is in uh, my loan basis in it, to be very high in every anything. So properties I'm buying, say, for 250, 260, I'm doing 40, 50,000 rehab, plus 10, 15,000 to furnish them. Mm-hmm. So I'll take the cash flow and pay those down a little bit to get those loans. Whatever the neighborhood average loan is, my loan will always be less. Because tomorrow, if the economy collapses, my debt payments are very low. So then it doesn't matter. So I watched your video recently about mm-hmm. the 10 uh, top cities in uh, Chicago. Mm-hmm. Uh, you mentioned Dalton. Mm-hmm. Uh, the price point went down a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what do you feel about keeping the properties that uh, you bought it, you keep it, and the pr- you, you, you really see the cash flow? Right. You see some the principal, some principal reduction because the price point is still low. That there's not much uh, right. paying down a loan. But it's, the appreciation is mm-hmm. not there. Like, are you, wa- are you looking at the appreciation? So I don't, like so I'll give you an example, like South, South Suburbs. Now I don't have a, my license on ICE, so I can say this, right? That uh, Dalton, I would not keep for a rental. I would do a flip there. Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, so, but Midlothian, I would keep for a rental. Because Midlothian, the quality of the tenant pool, I like better. Alsip, I like better. Oak Lawn, 100%. Tinley Park, 100%. So what happens is this, man. You have a quality of a property. You have a quality of the area. So we base it on area first, then the type of property, and then the tenant pool. What is the percentage that will pay your rent if the economy collapses a little bit, right? So generally, people who are more blue-collar are going to have a harder time paying, right? So I don't want that tenant pool because that's where you're going to have a harder time managing them. Mm-hmm. Right? Even though those properties cash flow a little bit more, I will give up a little bit of cash flow to have more equity in a property. Like in Schaumburg, I'm happy to buy a property, $150,000 equity. My cash flow is only three hundred. dollars It's okay. Mm-hmm. I'll buy it. Mm-hmm. Because why? It's okay. It's a solid. I mean, it's like buying gold, man. Right? Once I buy it, for the next five generations, it never has to be sold. You look at your cash on cash or no? I, I don't have any money stuck in the deal. Right, you pull uh, everything out. Yeah. So I mean, cash I cash think two properties infinite. out of 260 that I own that I have any money out of pocket, ever. So it's like... Uh, have, you done, have you ever done owner financing deals? I don't do it. No. I do not do it. I'm against it. Because I don't want to sell the property. You have to sell an owner finance? You can refi. Well, no, no, no. Because if, what if they call your... What if they basically are ready to pay it off, man? What if they basically, I'll give you an example. Bill Powers, um, he's a good guy for you to have on. Mm. Um, you know, he did some of that up in Waukegan in that area, owner finance properties. He was buying. He was buying and then basically putting tenants in them uh-huh. and doing an owner finance for them, right? No, no, I, w- I mentioned this. Oh, uh, on the front end. Mm-hmm. Like I you buying that, from the it. owner. Yeah, I've done that a couple of times, but very selectively. Very. I bought the gas station that way. Right. That's how I had done that. Uh-huh. Right, I've done a couple of deals that way. I just did a subject two property in uh, Burr Ridge mm-hmm. that way, oh. um, you know, but not a whole lot. Mm-hmm. Right, with creative financing, I want to be kind of um, very careful. Let's just put it that way, because I see a lot of it is going on, and people are pushing the envelope. And uh, there's a fine line where it's okay, and where I can't believe you haven't been on a bigger pocket yet. No, I haven't, man. I, I don't have any contacts there. I haven't. You should reach out. You know, yeah. It'd be a good podcast. Yeah, they should. Uh, they have all different topics. You know, sure. they promote now. Now the Airbnb topic has been kind of. I I used to watch a lot of the bigger pocket stuff, yeah. but then lately, uh, I kind of skipping. You know, it's it's a great a forum. What a yes. great forum it is. My only challenge with some of those things is that make it too easy. Make it look Man, too nobody talks about net net numbers. Yes. Everybody talks about how many properties. Yeah. Right? I mean, how many properties, it doesn't mean anything. 
So it's about net numbers. I'll give you an example. I've, one of the guys that uh, we have, so they have a, a portfolio. They had a portfolio in the uh, south suburbs, right? In south suburbs, you have some suburbs that are great. Some suburbs are mediocre. Some suburbs are not so, uh, you know, in terms of economy, right? And they built up a huge portfolio in some of the suburbs that were eh, not doing so well, right? And uh, and at the time, I'm like, hey, man, I would be careful. Don't load up too much there. I would always have, if I have this, then I need some better quality. Use the cash flow from the ones that are not the best quality because your cash flow is so heavy and then pay off the ones that are good quality. You can own these forever. Like, no, but Andrew, man, cash flow is so good. Cash flow is so good. Guess what happened during Corona? Nobody would make any payments. People destroy the property. They have to fix the property, but they couldn't get the people out. And so uh, they had a portfolio of 55 properties. They ended up selling 28, 29. Mm. But a bunch of them were evictions at the end. A bunch of were... Now, they come came out ahead because the property prices went through the roof, mm-hmm. right? But... Uh, and I think they would have been well served to balance that portfolio with another portfolio that was a little bit better quality, right? You can't just chase cheap properties with cheap tenants. And that results, I think, in a lot of headaches. But what do you think about the expensive properties? When the economy takes a turn, then the expensive properties are being tough to... But you can't buy expensive properties either. You got to buy that mid- mid-sector. Right, right. That's buy. my See, opinion too. like in any town, right? Like let's just say Schaumburg. You have properties that are from starting price uh, 250 all the way to a million, right? That's top end of the market. But anything over 600, it doesn't make any sense. For Schaumburg, Northbrook would be different. Park Ridge would be different. But for that market, for a rental property, that 250 to the 350 price range, that's it. The kind of the mid to low sector is where you need to operate. So because those people always will have jobs. Even if they lose a job, they'll always get a job. Default rate is the lowest in that sector. You pay attention to election today? I don't. You think it matters or no? No, it definitely matters for your taxes. It definitely matters. Problem is we live in a pretty, you know, a state that's gone out of the hand. (laughs) And uh, the, the sad part of the reality is this, man. Economically, if you're on the low end of the totem pole, you're getting screwed. It's a fact of life, yeah. right? I mean, it's like people, uh, everybody despises the 1%, but everybody wants to be the 1%, yeah. right? right? And I figured out a long right. time ago that you can't fight them. Might as well just become them, Join, right? Yeah. And it's Join the not club. That, yeah, it, it's not that difficult. 1% now is no big deal. They country. say 1% is uh, those who earn $450,000 a year. Yeah. That's a 1%. Yeah. You know, and net worth, right? Net so, worth, I don't know how much you're going to be. Net worth today is two point three billion. Million? Two point three billion. Two point two point three. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. To be the one percent. And Doable. that's I mean, with what we have, what we do on the agent side, on the investment side, dude. Yeah. Every single you have person to re- can you do have that. to invest for sure to yeah. get there. Yeah. 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 Just just selling and pile up the cash. You it's have impossible. to invest. Yeah. Impossible. I mean uh-huh. and, and you know, I'm not gonna mention some who it is, but like literally in the office that I was in, there were a couple of agents really good agents, hardworking people, yeah. been in the business long time, like top producers. Like on the state thing, they were showing up as high as GCI earned, yeah. right? And something interesting, devastating happened in their lives with something, and they had to spend a couple hundred thousand bucks, and they were down to zero after spending a couple hundred thousand bucks. After this many years of work, and these people are in the 60s or so, and like literally, and I had a high amount of respect for them, right? But the problem is, it's like with the agents, right? What your GCI is and what your net is, right? right. Gross commissions earned versus uh, there's a lot of teams, uh, you know, that spend yeah. so much money on leads. versus what your net is. I mean, we yeah. have a lot of agents that come to what I do. At thirty percent of everybody is an agent, mm-hmm. right? And there's a lot of good agents that'll come and um, and I talked with somebody yesterday, right? This guy does five hundred fifty thousand a year in holds. I mean in just his ad budget. Ad budget. Ad budget for wholesales, right? Ad budget. Has a real estate license, right? Great, great guy. I'm like, how many properties do you have, man? One, right? And you're doing legitimately a couple hundred wholesales, right? So this is a top producer. If you're in real estate, you'd be a top producer by any means, 
But yet, what do you have to show for it? Nothing. And, and to me, income is not... And you've seen the deals before everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, but right. yet, he's, the business is set up in a way where he has to sell everything. Yeah. Right? Uh, and th- it's a different mindset. Yeah. Right? It's a very different mindset because, I mean, I wish there were so many good agents that I used to work with and it was like, oh, Andrew, you know, it's not going to work. That was, well, those two properties work for you. Oh, well, it works for you. It's not going to work for anybody else. These people come to the office. And it's like, it's sad, the attitude that we used to have. This little room in the real estate office was half the size of this. Mm-hmm. And we grew out of that. Then it was a bigger end of the office I rented. We grew out of that. And it's like, all these people show up. They want any properties. I'm like, you know, the sad part is all these people, cheapskates, <laughs> they own more properties than all these agents put together in the office. And there were 100 agents in the office, right? And it's sad to see that because we buy our own BS, right? You sell a few properties, you make pretty good money. Problem is it's spent, right? What do you have to show for it? And that's where it's... That's one of my also questions, like um, the money uh, that like, uh, let's say I make, um, I'm also, I'm investing into the brokerage, but I'm also like, I want to invest into real estate. Not not less, than what I'm, you know, I'm trying to, yeah. is, that, is that good? I mean, it makes sense. It's like, it, see, I think at different points in your life, it becomes, is like now, and I had never thought about from this perspective, is what is a saleable business, mm-hmm. right? The seminars and events I do, right? I mean, it generates millions of dollars in revenue. I mean, mm-hmm. genuinely does. But then it costs millions of dollars, right? A lot of people are, oh my God, that Andrew, man, he does these, he charges a lot of money. Of course we do. Mm-hmm. Right, we make no apology, but it costs a lot of money to run that business. Guess what happened when Corona hit? Zero. We couldn't do one event. Now financially, I didn't it. have to let anybody off, right? But and then we picked it up, and we didn't miss a beat, fortunately. But every other company who's in that space, see what they did is they started selling that whole idea of investing. They never did it themselves. Yeah. For me, and I told everybody, I'm like, guys, we're shut down for a year. Don't worry about it. You're not going to lose your job, yeah. right? Because I'm not going to let go of good people because they're hard to find. But I had revenue from all the other stuff. Rentals, even during Corona, 99.9% collection rate. Yeah. Right? I was a little bit worried. I had, uh, at that time, 13 rentals, and I was worried about two. They were servers, right. bartenders, but they told me, I will pay. Yeah. Um, and they got some money from help sure. from the government. No, and and we had to okay. work with some people, right? Yeah. They're good people, man. Yeah. Right? I mean, what do you do when the world shuts down? I tried to call everybody right. who I sure. was worried about. I'm like, Absolutely. if there's something, let me know, because I sure. could do something with a mortgage. But, you know, that's genuine, and you could do that. It didn't put you financially behind, yeah. right? And it's prudence, man. What I'm trying to get across to people is, hey, guys, we have to be prudent. But somebody like you today, you have to look at, okay, if I'm going to spend time in building a business, is this a saleable business? Yes. Right? Could I scale up at some point, and can I sell that? Like for me, all the properties that I own, all the cash flow that I have, there is a monetary value to it, mm-hmm. right? All the seminars, it's Andrew Holmes events, mm-hmm. right? Andrew Holmes is gone tomorrow, has zero value. You know, right? like a Dave Ramsey, yeah. you know Dave Ramsey on YouTube? Yeah. That's why he started introducing other actors into right. his, you know, uh, things. That, so, so he says, like, I'm... I don't know how many, 60 something or almost 70. Yeah. He says, one day I'll, I'll decide not to do this anymore. Absolutely. So I have them keep doing it. And so a lot of people have done that, right? Uh, there's a company, um, I don't know if you know of uh, Think Media. Think Media, yeah. yeah great Sean, company. What is Sean, it? Sean yeah, whatever. Yeah. Right? I mean, if you know, look at their format, they're doing the whole social media there's thing. There's a bunch of them. There's a bunch of them, right? So what they're doing is it's Think Media. Yes. Right? It's not Sean. Right. Right? And a lot of times it's that megalomaniac the one person Mm -hmm. right it's great they're successful until they're not Mm -hmm. right and your income can get wiped out and especially if your lifestyle is big right i mean that's one thing i think besides the airplane i don't really do anything uh, how much you paid for your plane 250 a year to keep to To just to operate it and to fly really thousand a year yeah but how much to buy buy it was not expensive it was like 1.2 1.3 Man, to buy the airplane is cheap, mm. right? I'm looking at another one, like it's 4.2 million. To buy you, is no big deal. You fly? Yeah. You you know how to do it? Oh yeah, yeah. I got all my ratings. License and pilot, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I want to buy a bigger one, and uh, I my budget, like operating budget for the year, fuel, this, that, all the stuff. It's got to go to half million. 
Man. And I got to have a full time because I don't want to have the stress of flying because when you, I mean, you got people in the back, mm. eight, nine people in the back, right? And I don't want to have to do, because now you're getting, because you're flying up at 35,000 feet, right? This is not a joke. Right? This <laughs> is not your little plane which you go from here to for a hamburger, right? I mean, now you're, so yeah, if I buy that one, I'll just put a full-time pilot on staff. Full-time you know, pilot. Yeah, because now you're paying, you, man. You're going to put the logos on the, on the plane? Yeah, I mean, I thought you about have, it. You have those on now or not? I don't, no. I don't. I was going to get a pay, but I keep saying I'm going to buy a bigger one. And you know, I if this year and last year so occupied with more properties that I got distracted. I mean, in a good way. Do you have right? something like you want to be remembered for? You know, making an impact, man. Yeah. Making. I mean, the biggest blessing I have today, genuinely, uh, when I do these three days, we have so many people that show up that have so many properties and I don't even know them. Mm -hmm. Like they're in mastery today and they're like, oh, we're up to, so we'll try to recognize them as many people as we can. There's nobody in our life calls you and says, hey man, you got 20 properties, let's give you an award, right? Because that recognition is what we all, I mean, we want, we all want to work hard, we all want to make money. But at some point there's a group of people that recognizes what we're doing, it yeah. feels good, yeah. right? And today, and I was the guy at one time in an audience, in the seminar that was like, oh my God, how do these people make it up to stage? Yeah. Today we built a platform where we can recognize people, people literally who started with nothing. Right? There's a guy in Chicago, he used to have a business for shoe shine, mm -hmm. right? fixing shoes. He came to Mastery five years ago, mm -hmm. right? He has 19 properties, two and three units, eight of them completely paid off, mm -hmm. completely paid off. Right, just bought a farm, sixty acres on owner finance. Now his daughter is going to school, paying for for she's going to be an architect with the two two flats she bought. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean think about and this guy from Mexico, right? I mean if I put it in a crude way, this guy was shoe shine stand to a multi million in real estate. Mm -hmm. right? And the fun part is that when he came, he had two properties that were short sales. And they were on his wife's credit, and they couldn't figure out what to do. Mm. He lived in one, and his, uh, his parents lived in one. Mm -hmm. And they were desperate to save those properties, right? And it seems like it was like of a kind of five years is not that long a time. But the cool part about it is, I'm like, man, listen, you're Hispanic. You know the Hispanic neighborhoods. Right. Stay there. Mm -hmm. Do not leave those. Buy properties within your neighborhoods because you know the tenants, right? Live in one, right. literally, he bought properties, 203K loan. Yes. First one, rented it out. I'm like, at the end of it, month six or seven, start looking for your next one. Mm -hmm. Buy the next one. Then do a refi, pay that loan back. The next, oh, why am I buying a bigger building? Well, because I'm, this is too small. You helped out the with next uh, one. loans the next and one. all that? No, so we showed him how to do it. Yeah. Right? I'm like, go to this person. Right? Oh, two, uh, for two, two or 3K, right, right, right. So yeah, they could two or 3K, the and lender. then he scaled, now he's doing commercial loans, yeah. right? I mean, it was the most fun thing because I just did a loan for his daughter, right? That was her first property. And I was personally able to do a loan. I used to be on the other side, right? And today to be able to do that with people that are, some people are extremely well off when they come. They don't need me, right? But they show up because they want to take their net, investing to the next level, if that makes any sense. And then people where we can make a difference and we can see the difference a year, two years, four years from now. And in some way, as a real estate agent, I was selling a house. Here, we're changing people's financial future, right? And it's like you have an idea and somebody else adopts it and it works for them. You're like, oh, this is pretty good. I'm pretty smart, yeah. right? You feel blessed That's awesome. that Feels good. you had that opportunity, right? Yeah. So we're gonna make, we're gonna get Carlos into investing in yeah. real estate. Buying his first multi flat, you know, multi unit building. We That's should, man. You know. That's a goal. I, I convinced. Uh, he lives Lori. in Hermosa. Oh, huh? Lori, Lori. Oh, yeah. I saw Lori bought something. Yeah. Yeah. Lori bought. Lori is on her now fourth property. Wow. You know, the funniest thing was Lori always thought she had a student loan, $90,000. And she never thought she's doing hundreds and hundreds of transactions for other people, like handling sure. the paperwork, loans, this, that. She's doing all this stuff. And she, she always felt left out, right? And she should, these events would bother her like no tomorrow. You know, it's like you're looking at these people and you're like, oh my God, I knew this person two years ago. Yeah. And 
For the sure. funniest thing was the first property she bought, Glenwood. Simple condo. We're talking about condo, right? $40,000. I found the condo and I'm like, hey, Lori, $40,000. Oh, I can never buy it. Can never. I'm, I'm telling you, this <laughs> is the condo to buy. Simple one bedroom. Guess what? The condo is completely paid off. Properties are selling today. 130, 140 over there, right? Second one, Glendale Heights, two bedroom, one bath, two bedroom, one and a half bath, townhouse by North Avenue, mm-hmm. right? That one is paid down quite a bit. She bought a condo for herself to live in, right? Those are big goals for somebody who has 90,000 in, de- in debt, right? And then she bought a two flat. Every single month, it nets out 1260 a month. Her payment on the debt is 900 bucks a month, mm. right? And it's, it's small steps, and it's not, her race is not against me, my race is not against you, your race is not against somebody else. Sure. We're all running a different race. Yes. But I think it's, we have an ability and we're in a business that can absolutely change our lives. But you need a little bit of a patience. Like I've, you know, I've always believed this, that if you take care of real estate for the first five years, real estate will take care of you for the rest of your life. Yeah. But it was the first thing I heard from you. Right. No, I mean, that I believe in. A long time ago. I I really believe in that. That, I mean, being a real estate agent is a lottery ticket to being a multimillionaire. Right. And the reason why, because it puts you closer to deals. Yes. It puts you closer to people who do deals. Yes. Right. And yet the problem, what happens a lot of times is we're so good as agents helping everybody else that we forget to help ourselves. Right? And that's the saddest part of this whole equation is that uh, well, your kids are not good enough. It's just for the other people's kids. Yeah. And I think the, realis- the day that realization hits, it changes. On that note, I guess. Thank you very much, man. This Thank has been an Andrew absolute so pleasure. Much. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Hope to see you soon. Uh, if you have any questions to Andrew, uh, how, do, how, do, how do anybody reach out to you if they have... They can uh, uh, reach out at chicagoria.com. Mm-hmm. That's Chicago. And then Ria, R-E-I-A, dot com and contact us. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. See you guys. Thanks so much, guys. Have a good day.